Good morning, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to this special Schiller Institute conference. The moral collapse of the transatlantic world cries out for a new paradigm. I'm Harley Schlanger, and I will moderate the first panel, which is entitled The March of Folly. Can mankind still extinguish the now lit fuse of thermonuclear war? As we meet, the survival of the human race is imperiled as perhaps never before. We face the danger of a new world war, including the possible use of nuclear weapons, of a systemic breakdown of the real physical economy, which keeps more than seven plus billion people alive, and the collapse of which brings with it famine and an out of control pandemic. But these threats do not arise from the so-called malign intent of Russia and China. Despite the accusation of leaders of most governments and parties in the transatlantic world, who charge them with aggression against the so-called rules-based order. Nor do they come from so-called man-made climate change, being used to club nations into giving up their sovereign rights to submit their nations and citizens to a deadly looting process enforced by a central banker's global dictatorship committed to radical population reduction. This is the intent of those who demand a submission to a rules-based order, the use of the U.S. military to impose a unilateral world order, which rejects principles of international law in favor of the dictates of arbitrary rules, which serve the narrow interests of the City of London and Wall Street. In our deliberations today, let us be inspired by the words spoken by President John F. Kennedy on June 10, 1963 shortly after the successful resolution of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which threatened to unleash a nuclear war between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. In speaking for the adoption of a nuclear test ban treaty, Kennedy said, what kind of peace do we seek? Not a Pax Americana enforced on the world by American weapons of war. Not the peace of the grave or the security of the slave. I'm talking about genuine peace, the kind of peace that makes life on earth worth living, the kind that enables men and nations to grow and to hope and to build a better life for their children, not merely peace for Americans, but peace for all men and women, not merely peace in our time, but peace in all time. He continued saying that by directing our attention to our common interests, differences can be resolved. For in the final analysis, he concluded, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures. And we are all mortal. Four years later, Pope Paul VI summarized this view with his encyclical Populorum Progressio, proclaiming development is the new name of peace. Achieving this has been the goal of the life's work of economist and statesman Lyndon LaRouche, and has been the mission adopted by the Schiller Institute since it was founded in 1984 by his wife, Helga Zepp LaRouche. Today, we have a distinguished panel of speakers representing many nations, guided by this common goal, and I will introduce them after the first speaker. But it's most appropriate to begin with a keynote by the Schiller Institute's Helga Zepp LaRouche. It's my honor to introduce Helga Zeppler-Rusch. I greet all of you wherever you may be <clears throat> around the world. And I'm <clears throat> telling you that we are conducting this Schiller Institute conference with an urgent appeal to as many people <clears throat> as possible to help to change the direction in which the political, political situation is going right now because we are on a course which in a very short period of time, much shorter than anybody is probably realizing, we are on a course of potential extinction of civilization. And it's not clear <clears throat> where the greater danger comes from. The danger of thermonuclear war, the danger of a pandemic going out of control in combination with a world famine or with a neo Malthusian virus, which has beset the brains of so many people, where it is not clear if they are more eager to destroy the industrial society or if they are willing instruments to 
the geopolitical confrontation against Russia and China. So let's start with the danger of thermonuclear war. And it's not just one a trigger point, one strategic crisis. It is the overall tension <clears throat> between the United States, the so-called global Britain, NATO, and increasingly also the European Union with Russia and China, <clears throat> that it's becoming so big that any one of the crises around the globe could become the trigger point. Now, it could be a crisis with Russia over Ukraine going out of control or with China over Taiwan. And it is alarming and should alarm all of you that now more and more people, even so unlikely ones like Henry Kissinger, who has been not exactly a friend of our organization, which has everything to do with his infamous NSM 200 uh, <clears throat> paper, which he uh, wrote when he was national security advisor in 74, that he was the enemy and the adversary of everything Lyndon LaRouche and his movement stood for. But even Kissinger is now warning that <clears throat> the tension between the United States and China are becoming so uh, all engulfing for the whole world that they could lead to an Armageddon-like military clash, extinguishing mankind in a finite period of time, This he said about a week ago. Then the commander of the U.S. Strategic Dem uh, Command, Admiral Charles Richard, recently in February informed the Pentagon that they should change the <coughs> likelihood of nuclear war from not likely to very likely. And he repeated that in front of the Congress recently. Just two days ago, the New York Times had an article by one Peter Beinart who said that the Biden policy towards Taiwan is truly reckless, uh, that we are very close to war, <clears throat> um, mainly because the Democrats have abandoned the one China policy already last year. Biden is now receiving envoys from Taiwan, like he did for his inauguration. Uh, <clears throat> and then the article quotes uh, Graham Ellison, the historian who thinks that a Thucydides uh, danger exists, the danger of a Thucydides trap, uh, by saying that people have to be sure that China would be more willing to go to war than rather to accept losing Taiwan. And in light of the history of China, this is very likely. Now, if it would come to such a war, given the fact that China has 39 air bases around this region of Taiwan, the United States has only two. Um, the United States would lose any conventional war. And if it would think of using regionally nuclear weapons, the danger is that it would go into an all-out global nuclear war. And I <coughs> advise those people who don't think that that is true to read the papers by Ted Postol over the difference between conventional and <coughs> thermonuclear uh, war, uh, where it is the logic that once you use one nuclear weapons, all will be used. And also listen to what Tulsi Gabbard said recently in a show with uh, Tucker Carlson, where she said that to have this geopolitical confrontation with Russia is completely crazy. So, uh, Russia has thousands of nuclear weapons who in a conflict would hit Every U.S. city in less than 30 minutes, this would bring about excruciating death and suffering over the American people who <clears throat> would basically, um, you know, millions would lose their lives and flesh would be burned from their bones. And <clears throat> that would be the end of the world. And this would be, uh, could come much sooner than anybody thinks. Now, also the Australian press is warning that Taiwan may be a trigger for a catastrophic war and that it is not just a question if, but when. <clears throat> that China has become the enemy uh, for no other reason than it has dared to eclipse the U.S. as the most powerful economy. And on March 21st, <clears throat> Admiral Philip Davidson, the head of the India uh, Indo-Pacific Command, 
uh, said we must be absolutely prepared to fight and win such a war uh, <clears throat> and it should be uh, should competition turn into conf conflict then the u.s a Pacific Fleet Commander, Admiral John Aquilino, who will replace uh, Admiral Davidson in his position, said, we are much closer to such a war than most think. And McMaster's, the former National Security Advisor to Trump, uh, basically said the most dangerous time, in his view, is the period between the Congress of the Chinese CPC Communist Party later this year, and the Winter Olympics in Beijing next year. So that is indeed very closed. Now, the Taiwan Defense Minister already announced that they will now mass produce long-range missiles capable of striking deep into the inside of the Chinese mainland. Now, so the situation around Taiwan could be the trigger point for a global war but so could the situation over uh, Ukraine. Now, with the uh, developments in Ukraine, you had an escalation in the recent years of an incredible demonization of President Putin. But it has nothing to do with Crimea, because as Putin correctly said, if it would not have been Ukraine, they would have found some other reason. Now, the narrative of what is going on with Russia, Ukraine, Crimea is completely upside down. It did not start with the so-called annexation of Crimea. It started with the EU Association Agreement for Ukraine, end of 2013, which was rejected for good reasons. And then it led, that led quickly to the demonstrations on the Maidan which escalated into the coup, uh, leading to a Nazi coup in February 2014. And as a consequence then, uh, you know, in which coup Victoria Nuland, who is now again in the, in the position in the Defense Department, uh, <clears throat> then you had the development where the people of Crimea voted to join Russia. Now, <clears throat> you have right now by Blinken and Nuland in Ukraine, and, you know, this is a very dangerous game because they are there to further the building of U.S. bases in Ukraine to uh, support the demand by the Ukrainians to join NATO. And that is reaching then a point where Putin has recently said that people in the West should not cross red lines because if it would occur, the response would be asymmetric, swift and hard. Now, Russia is a nuclear superpower, and this could lead, if it would be provoked to answer uh, in such a, a way, to the annihilation of mankind. Now, Scott Ritter, uh, of fame, of having warned of the weapons of mass destruction not being a, a fake story in Iraq, recently commented, commented the Defender Europe 21 large maneuver, which is going on right now uh, along the Russian border, by basically saying that all which this demonstrates is that NATO is absolutely inferior as compared to the Russian uh, troops in a conventional way. And that therefore the danger would be that if it comes to a conflict, it could go nuclear. Now, there was a rent corporation study in uh, 2016, which said, war with China, thinking through the unthinkable, where they basically say it would be better to have the war with China now than in 10 years, because the gap will close and China will probably win such a war later on. The same rent corporation had a study in 2019 Extending Russia, uh, uh, extending Russia, competing from advantageous ground, which is a 354-page piece in which they describe how one should overextend Russia, Russia economically, militarily, and propaganda-wise. Number one, <coughs> conduct economic warfare, hinder the oil export 
block export of natural gas, block the construction of pipelines, such as Nord Stream 2, escalate sanctions, escalate the brain drain, uh, <clears throat> escalate the situation with Ukraine, uh, bring lethal weapons to Ukraine, support the rebels in Syria, topple Lukashenko, increase the cost for Russia in the South Caucasus, go for uh, color revolution in Moldavia, Disc discredit the election process in Russia, like Navalny, cause unrest in <clears throat> uh, Russia, uh, go for color revolution, put military bombers, missiles at the border to cause permanent stress for Russia. Um, promote Rush, uh, pr provoke Russia into a costly arm arms race. Now, if you listen to that so-called study, uh, you have the exact script for about everything what happened in the last two years. Now, this conference actually was caused to happen by the urgent appeal by Cardinal Mario Zenari from Syria. Uh, <clears throat> where he is, uh, has been issuing a call saying that as a result of the combination of 10 years of war in which the United States was allied with Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra and ISIS, these are my words, not his, uh, <clears throat> which were aimed to topple the legitimate elected government of Syria, uh, <clears throat> the pandemic and the so-called Caesar sanction that we have now a situation where more than 90% of the Syrian population are be below the poverty line. And the, uh, I just should note that the so-called Caesar sanctions are based on the same kind of fraud like we have seen it as a pretext for all of these uh, endless wars like the weapons, uh, the chemical weapons supposedly used by the Syrian government which was a fraud by the white helmets or the <clears throat> uh, babies ripped out of incubators in 91, which was a lie. Uh, then you had the so-called weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, 2003, yellow cake from Niger. Uh, <clears throat> this was all a complete lie. Now, <sighs> unilateral sanctions, such as these Caesar sanctions, are from a standpoint of international law completely illegal. And we will hear about that from Professor Kirschler shortly. The only kinds of sanctions which are allowed would be those which are uh, <clears throat> agreed upon by the UN, National, uh, UN Security Council. Otherwise, unilateral sanctions are a form of warfare which targets the poor, the old people, the children, it is the idea to drive the pain of the population so high because of a lack of food, lack of medicine, that eventually it will cause an uprising uh, and conduct regime change. Brian O'Toole, who is a senior fel fellow at the Atlantic Council and a former advisor to the U.S. Treasury, and he worked for the CIA, uh, he is an expert in so-called behavior economics, basically said that uh, this is a strategy to raise the pain meter, what an insane impre uh, expression. Uh, for Russia, it would only be a 10% of this pain meter, and it would be important to drive it up to 70% uh, by cutting Russia off SWIFT, the connection to the international financial system, and to cut off share bank from uh, financial transactions. Now, for Syria, it means the, the continuation of these Caesar sanctions mean the death for many thousands, maybe millions of people. But the people who are conducting this, they say literally, so what? I'm not exaggerating. Madame Albright uh, said on a 60-minute program, 60 program with Leslie Stahl that the half million children who died in Iraq as a result of the sanctions, these were children under the age of five, she said, it's a very hard choice, but the price was worth it. Now, David Beasley, uh, the 
uh, head of the World Food Program um, just made a documentary about the famine in Yemen called Hunger Ward, which I would urge everybody to, to watch. He showed how <clears throat> in Yemen uh, there were little girls with arms as thin as my finger, and they, are, uh, ho they had hollow eyes, and their skin was part menti because of the starvation process. And I think Mrs. Albright should have nightmares every single night where each of these 500,000 dying children from Iraq look at her and haunt her, uh, looking at her with their dying eyes. And this should continue until this woman has a human feeling. Now, the situation is much worse uh, because <clears throat> according to the World Food Program, uh, the, the new report they published, 2021 Global Report on Food Crisis, says 55 nations are in extreme need for food and for Syria because of the sanctions, the war, the depreciation of the pound, uh, <clears throat> there are, is now a very high number of food insecure people. Because the food price from December 2019 to 2020 increased by 236%. Now that means that altogether in all of these nations, altogether 40 nations, 34 million are in acute danger of starvation in the coming month. And Beasley at the CIPRI Institute, that's the Stockholm Institute for Peace Research, said that uh, he called on all nations to mobilize uh, the <clears throat> urgent support to avert mass deaths of millions of people actually a number of people, which is very quickly going to be as much as all of World War II was causing. Now, he, he mentioned that <clears throat> um, the UN Security Council Resolution 2417 was passed unanimously in 2018, and that resolution said very clearly that hunger cannot be used as a weapon of war. Now, there are right now 155 million people in acute food insecurity. These are countries like Afghanistan, Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, Haiti, Northern Nigeria, South Sudan, Sudan, Syria, Yemen, Zimbabwe. Now, in um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in India, has already <clears throat> officially caused uh, 238,000 deaths. But according to experts, it is five to 10 times as high because they count only the people who die in hospitals uh, <clears throat> and not the people who, can, who die in the countryside. Um, <clears throat> now, the few plane loads of aid which are being by international countries is uh, just a drop in the ocean. The head of the African CDC said that they are horrified by looking at India because most of the vaccination which came to Africa was produced there. And now with the crisis exploding in India, they are <coughs> worried <coughs> that no more vaccine is coming. Now, <coughs> the, uh, it is also uh, clear that we are looking at mass deaths in Brazil and uh, many other places. Now, if you look at this picture as a totality, and that is why we you know, have to really, uh, what we have to do, the chickens are coming home to roost. We are now at the exact point Lyndon LaRouche predicted in 1971 when Nixon destroyed the old Bretton Woods system and went on a course of monetary liberal policies. Lyndon LaRouche at that point said, if you continue on this course, it will come to a point where you are faced with the danger of a new depression, the danger of war, and the danger of a new fascism. And my late husband was 
also absolutely correct when he warned already in 73 that the IMF conditionalities would mean the new that new pandemics would come and you know that you know basically uh, that would eventually uh, be a total threat to civilization now the financial system is about to blow we are looking at a situation where after the 2008 systemic crisis nothing was done to remedy the root causes but just quantitative easing and uh, uh, you know pumping money by the trillions and now we are looking at the potential of a hyperinflationary blowout like it was in Germany in 1923 now in 1923 the Reichsbank printed money to pay the war debt and the reparations and you know first you didn't see much of it but then in November 2023 uh, it exploded and it was the complete expropriation of the life work of the people now <clears throat> yesterday the bank of uh, america uh, put out a report saying that you know we had have just a transitionary hyperinflation uh, this is visible because all the commodity prices are going up uh, but that this will soon translate in an increase in consumer prices now a hyper uh, a transitionary hyperinflation is as much as being a little bit pregnant uh, <clears throat> so uh, however you know that that hyperinflation is the necessary result of all of this uh, policy which only furthered speculation uh, in the last period is known to all big players and this is the real reason why <clears throat> they are betting to create one more last uh, super bubble by <clears throat> uh, basically going for the great reset uh, the great transformation of the decarbonization of the world economy the green new deal uh, and it is the illusion that if they pump now in the next 10 years another 60 trillion into the financial system uh, that that would somehow save uh, their uh, earnings and their system but it would just mean a gigantic transfer of wealth again from the poor to the rich now this is already uh, you know on the horizon it's happening because the EU is uh, implementing the Green New Deal the Biden administration is doing it and while that only threatens the deindustrialization of the so-called advanced countries for the uh, <clears throat> for the developing countries it basically means mass death on top of the crises i already mentioned uh, the indian energy minister mr singh uh, recently said that you know the green deal may be okay for the indus industrialized nations but absolutely not for the developing sector alone in africa 800 million of africans don't have have access to electricity it would mean um, and these are my words now it would mean an absolute massive reduction of the population and it is also clear that this is their intent now what is to be done um, there is a solution but it is important to take all these problems at once because when you have a systemic crisis like what i'm describing with these different elements it is not enough to solve a little bit of this and a little bit of that crisis but you have to create a completely different system now president putin in january 2020 called for an urgent meeting of the permanent five members of the un security council and i think that that is what must absolutely happen now such a summit should be called because of the danger of world war 3 a pandemic out of control, a world famine, the danger of a blowout of the financial system, and uh, <clears throat> it uh, basically must lead to an immediate implementation of the following program. Given the pandemic, the only way to stop that and future pandemics is we have to create a world health system which means a modern health system in every single country. Because if you don't 
stop the pandemic in even the poorest country on the planet, it will come back. The, there will be new variants, new strains, which eventually could make obsolete the vaccines which already have been uh, distributed. So we are in a race against time. So we should do in every single country what was done in Wuhan when the pandemic broke out, build hospitals. Uh, this can be done with the Corps of Engineers, with aid organizations. In one week, one can build a hospital for a thousand people. Then these modern hospitals need well-educated doctors, nurses. You need lots of clean water. Two billion people in the world have no access to clean water. You need lots of electricity. This cannot be done without infrastructure. So the building of a modern health system in every country can and must be the beginning of overcoming the underdevelopment of the developing countries uh, for good. Now, we have to have a program of global poverty alleviation, exactly as it was intended by Franklin D. Roosevelt when he called for the Bretton Woods, which was never implemented because of his untimely death. But now we need exactly that. It must start with a global class legal banking separation, which then must be followed by the creation of a Hamiltonian national banking system in every country. Uh, we need a credit system, uh, which then can become a new Bretton Woods system. Uh, and then we can finance the extension of the new Silk Road into Southwest Asia. The possibility to overcome the death and starvation in Syria, Yemen, Afghanistan, Iraq, the solution is obvious. Uh, when President Xi Jinping was in Saudi Arabia, Iran and Egypt in 2015, he offered to extend the new Silk Road into the entire region. Now that program, and the Schiller Institute has worked on a comprehensive program for the entire region, can be implemented if in such a P5 UN Security Council meeting, it is agreed and then all the big neighbors of Southwest Asia, Russia, China, India, all work together and the United States and European nations agree to cooperate in the reconstruction of this region, which has been destroyed by these endless wars. And then naturally the new Silk Road, with this international cooperation, including other countries like Japan, like India, <coughs> South Korea, should be all involved in the reconstruction of Africa. Now we have to replace geopolitical confrontation with a crash program cooperation for the development of thermonuclear fusion power, where in the recent period major breakthroughs have occurred. And once we have fusion power, we will have a safe energy source for the whole human population. And we will also tackle the problem of limited raw materials because you can separate isotopes with the fusion torch procedure and create new raw materials. And we have to have international cooperation in space rather than <coughs> extending geopolitical confrontation into space. We should have an international cooperation to build a village on the moon and soon a city on Mars. We should listen to the head of the uh, Mars mission and the head of the energy ministry of Abu Dhabi, Ms. Uh, Al Amiri, who recently or already some years ago made a beautiful speech where she stuck her finger in the air like this. Please put on the video. And she said, uh, people should look at uh, what is at the end of her finger uh, to see uh, what the sky will tell them. Can you put on the video, please? The Hubble Space Telescope was pointed at a region that small and it came up with this image. This image, the dots of light that you see in these images, are not stars, they're galaxies. There are hundreds of billions of stars, each one of those dots in that small region of sky that we look at. 
Now, the Hubble telescope discovered that there are minimum two trillion galaxies. And I would like you to really, you know, put your mind on that thought and then think how stupid it would be that we as a human species, who are the only species which can potentially be the immortal species because of our creative reason, that we would destroy ourselves in a thermonuclear destruction. I think we should have the ambition not to be more stupid than the animals, because there is no animal species which would ever conduct such a behavior. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helga. And Helga will be available later for questions. Uh, we've put up on the screen where you can send your questions. And now we'll move on to the next speaker. Uh, we're very delighted to have once again, Dr. Butaina Shaban, who is a passionate defender of the idea of sovereignty and the people of Syria. She's the political and media advisor to the Syrian presidency. And she will be available for questions immediately after her presentation which is titled Restore International Law, Respect Syria's Perfect Sovereignty. Dr. Shaban. Good morning to all of you. I would like first to thank my friend Helga LaRouche and the Schiller Institute and all of you for extending this invitation with, to me to be with you this morning uh, on a topic that touches my heart. I'd like to speak about uh, Syria and the world order and reflect on what happened during these last 10 years uh, and how is that relevant, in my opinion, to what your respect respectful conference is discussing. Right from day one of the war on Syria on March 15, 2011, we felt that we are fighting a double-edged war. One that is going on the streets with people of flesh and blood being led by well-organized secret forces which instruct them what to do and how to do it. And the second parallel war that deals with concepts and narratives and focuses on confusing the Syrian people about what is happening in their country and what is the ultimate objective of all these extraordinary movements, both on the streets and in Western media. I remember that on the 24th of March, the regional leadership, the Syrian le regional leadership and the government of Syria met and took brave decisions, which, which were meant to answer all the requests reiterated by those on the streets. I convened a press conference for all the media corps in Damascus on the same day, and Syrian people were so happy that evening, and some of them went out celebrating, believing that the whole problem is over. Far from it. The movement on the streets and the media war against Syria seemed to get new fuel and to spread in new areas in the country. Now that we got to read some leaks from different directions, we know, according to leaked British papers, for example, that the UK officially funded Syrian men and women, calling them eyewitnesses through different agents. All Western and Gulf media were withdrawn from Syria, and the entire Western media derived its news from these eyewitnesses and from one man who sits in Coventry, UK, whose name is Rami Abdurrahman, who invented for himself a, pl a platform called the Syrian Platform for Human Rights. Western and Gulf governments were pressing Syrian officials to dissent and bribing some of them with money to join those against the Syrian government, assuring them that the political system is going to fall and collapse within a week or two. Early in April 2011, I used to meet with the American, British, and French ambassadors and tell them that what you are instigating in Syria is not going to make the lives of Syrian people better. On the contrary, it will make their lives much worse, and Iraq 
is a live example. Now, after all the destruction that has befallen Syria and all the death, bloodshed, and loss of lives and institutions and archaeology and part of our civilized identity, it is very obvious to us that Western governments, especially their military and intelligence services, planned, trained, and sent thousands of terrorists with Saudi, Qatari, and Emirates money and Turkish backing to destroy Syria. And they were never interested in making Syria a better place for its people. Rather, they wanted to turn Syria to a destroyed satellite state that follows their orders and they can loot its resources, just like the war on Iraq, Libya, and Yemen. Thinking more deeply about this point, Western powers have always treated us as the colonized, actually, and derived their views about us from the Orientalists, who look down at us rather than from our reality, history, and from our set of values. Subjugating Syria was important for Western forces because Syria, as everybody knows, is the jewel of the crown in the Arab world. That's why they devoted billions of oil money, arms, and terrorists to do the job for them. Once they rec recognized that this is mission impossible due to the, to the resilience and sacrifices of the Syrian people, they shifted the focus from a military war to a horrifying, criminal, coercive, unilateral measures against the Syrian people, which are illegal on all counts because they are a form of collective punishment to the Syrian people. Once major terrorists were defeated, the U.S. sent its own military to starve the Syrian people and break their will. It is now quite clear from what has taken place in Iraq, Syria, Libya, and Yemen, that Western powers are intent on destroying our countries and looting our resources. The good byproduct of the war on Syria, if there is any good byproduct, is that China and Russia got together in taking double veto more than 10 times in Security Council to prevent further military aggression by Western forces against Syria. The case of Syria was very important in highlighting the need for a new paradigm. The arrogant American sanctions against Russia and China and their blatant interference in Chinese affairs through what they call the case of Taiwan, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, is hastening the birth of this new paradigm. I think one of the reasons why President Biden was elected is to restore the transatlantic relationship that suffered greatly during the previous administration. But their efforts will not reach the results they desire for more than one reason. First, China is an ascending economic, technological, and moral force, and its alliance with Russia and other countries will certainly establish a multipolar system. But the other reason is that the war on Syria helped to prove beyond any doubt that Western policies towards Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, and Yemen are bankrupt. And the narrative that fills their, their screens and papers is no longer credible. I am telling from the point of view of our people. We no longer believe in Western narrative. Many friends of mine, I'm included, used to be avid followers of Western media. Now, none of us waste his or her time to know what they are fabricating and what truths they are trying to conceal. Credibility is of utmost importance, whether regarding people or states or systems. And once it is lost, the party no longer exists. The latest example is what the OPCW did towards Syria. Although those who went on the ground to investigate the case gave clear evidence 
that the OPCW changed the facts found out by the team and wrote its own untruthful report to incriminate Syria. Still, they voted against Syria. The loser here is not Syria, it is the OPCW, because it has lost its credibility in the eyes of neutral and logical people. On the other hand, China and Russia are gaining credibility in the eyes of the world, and their address of the COVID-19 and of its vaccines is a clear example of the efficiency of China and Russia compared to the inefficiency of most Western countries in handling this plague. As far as our people and countries are concerned, we are sure that the transatlantic world is colonial power, but its reality and the lack of concern about lives and the greed of its ruling class in other people's fortune and the lies that their media are fabricating to market their criminal policies and worldwide had never been as exposed as they are today. I think we are witnessing the gradual collapse of 500 years old Western colonial empires and the rising dawn of the East. But we all have to be active partners in founding the new world system and in making sure that it reflects the ambition of humanity and the hope in a better, safer, more peaceful and more prosperous future. The consistent efforts exerted by Schiller Institute and by all of you at different platforms are important contributions towards that dawn that we, our children, and our grandchildren are waiting for. Thank you very much. Very happy to join you. And thank you again for inviting me to speak at this very important forum. Thank you very much, Dr. Shaban. I, I have one question in so far for you, which is from someone who is a military veteran who wrote, uh, actually, you brought up the OPCW controversy, the suppression of the truthful story, uh, or the, the made-up story, we should say, of the use of chemical weapons. The, the person said the, the whistleblowers who say there was no evidence that Syria used chemical weapons were suppressed by the OPCW, and the media will not cover them. And he asks, what can you say about the role of, of London-based groups such as the White Helmets and the one you mentioned in promoting the narrative that it's Syria's government's corruption, which is the problem. Um, thank you very much for this question. Uh, I think uh, there is such a huge gap between what is circulated in Western media and, the re and between the reality in Syria. Uh, all those who are interested in Syria and who are doing real investigative work in Syria know that the White Helmets are agents of many terrorist groups, and those terrorist groups are the ones who are fighting the war of the US and the West on, on, on the ground of Syria. Um, the OPCW case uh, re handling the Syrian uh, situation regarding chemical weapons uh, should really be highlighted as a very flagrant violation, not only of, a, of a human rights and of international law, but of the freedom of speech, because all these whistleblowers were asking to be heard by the OPCW, and yet they were not given the opportunity to present their cases. But the Russian ambassador Espinizia in the UN uh, gave uh, through the area forum a very important session uh, where all these people spoke. And in my opinion, and in the opinion of many others, proved beyond any doubt that all the evidence on Syria was fabricated. And so many sentences that proved that Syria did not use any chemical weapon were omitted from the report of 
original investigators. I would like to conclude by mentioning one thing, that in 2013, they started investigating, the OPCW started investigating chemical weapons in Syria. And they ended up in two years by writing a report that Syria is free of all chemical weapons and that Syrian government has cooperated in handling all its chemical weapons. How could they come back and invent stories accusing Syria of such a crime, which is absolutely groundless? I, I have one more question from a blogger uh, who writes, you, you offered what seemed to be an optimistic assessment of the future. What has given you and the people of Syria the courage to remain optimistic about the future? Thank you for this question. It's a very important question. The reason is that I'm talking to you from the eldest continuously inhabited capital in the world, Damascus that is over 10,000 years old. And so many invaders came and killed and destroyed, but they were defeated. And the Syrian people came up again and built their countries and continued their civilized history and continued to be a haven for other people whether in the region or out of the region, who suffered from injustices, like the uh, war on the Armenians and the Assyrians that was done in Turkey, in Ottoman Turkey in 1915. Thousands of Armenians joined the Syrian people and became Syrian people, and we are very proud of the heritage they brought with them with which they enriched our culture. When the war in Iraq took place, about 3 million Iraqis came to Syria. Not a single tent was put up. All of them went into our homes, into our houses, into our schools, into our universities. These are the Syrian people. This is the history of the Syrian people. And I don't think any power can change this resilient spirit and this hope and faith in a better future, not only for us, but for humanity at large. Dr. Shaban, thank you very much. For I don't have any more questions. Helga, did you want to say something? Uh, yes. I mean, first of all, I want to uh, greet you, uh, Dr. Shaban. And I'm very thank happy you. that you are joining us here. And I would like to ask you a question. Uh, Cardinal Senari um, basically said that there must be peace through development, that the only way you know, the situation can be uh, remedied is by economic development. Now, there was a donors conference recently where people uh, collected, I think, something like seven billion dollars for uh, Syria, but as far as I know, did that go to uh, in coordination with the Syrian government. I think there are still the views that you have to have first a post-Assad uh, government before any real reconstruction is allowed to take place. I would like you to comment on that. And lastly, if you think that my idea uh, to take the region as a whole, uh, all of Southwest Asia, uh, as an extension of the Silk Road, uh, is that, in your view, a realistic idea? And if so, what can be done to further the realization? Thank you, my friend Helga. And I really wanted to comment on your very important keynote speech. But after I uh, address uh, your question, I think that uh, the policy of the Syrian government now and the Syrian people is to go back to what we do best which is uh, agriculture and industry. Uh, we are very ancient in uh, plowing the land and growing uh, the crops. And I can assure you that this year, we feel a great difference between the years of the war and now 
so many people went back to promote agriculture, to rebuild their uh, factories, even small, tiny uh, workshops. But the Syrian people realize now that they have they have to do their own economic development, uh, regardless of all the pressure and all the criminal measures that are taking place uh, by the West against the Syrian people. And I'm sure uh, we can do it. But I'm also sure that things cannot continue this way. Uh, you know, the American occupation of the northeast of Syria, they are looting our wheat. In, uh, during the day, uh, they are looting our oil. They are preventing the Syrian people from their own natural resources uh, with the will and help of people such as uh, your good self. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm confident uh, that the future is going to be much better and we are going to be able to stop uh, occupiers, occupiers, terrorists, and uh, all those who do not believe in a human uh, community to stop them from further destruction. Uh, I would like to go back to uh, greet you, Helga, and say to you, thank you very much for your uh, keynote uh, address. And to say that I felt while you were talking that I would love to carry this speech and circulate it the world over. Uh, because it is uh, the antithesis of what Western colonial powers are doing. And I would like to say to you how I read it. I read it that you, Helga, and the Schiller Institute look at humanity, see humanity, see us, all of us, as a global uh, uh, brothers and sisters. While the imperial and colonial powers have always treated us or looked at us as second or third or fourth or fifth class citizens of the world. And they continue to do that because they are interested only in looting our resources and in, in making um, money for themselves while depriving our people of our own resources. I think your idea is great. But I, the problem is that they don't allow the Americans, you know, the reality here is that many Arab countries wanted to open their embassies immediately after we defeated the terrorists. But the United States would not let them open their em embassies. The United States would not allow the rapprochement between Iran and Saudi Arabia, for example. It will not allow the, the good relation and cooperation among Arab countries. Uh, so by using their military force and their hegemony, they are the ones who are really dictating how these states are behaving. And the, the, the basic reason for all this war on Syria is that Syria has its own sovereign, independent decision and we do not take orders. I have been in the political uh, sphere for the last 30 years, in the non-aligned, in the Islamic organization, in the, Arab, in the Arab League, all the time. The American ambassador or envoy will bring a written text and ask countries to accept that text and to adopt it in the final community. Syria was always, always the one who refused to take text or orders from Americans or from Western powers, because we are very proud people and we believe we deserve to be at least equal. Thank you. We have another couple minutes for one final question for you. This comes from Dr. Marie Louise Heuser. And she says, Syria is known for good coexistence of different religions. And she asks if you could say something about that. Well, I, uh, when, when I gave that press conference on the 24th of March in 2011, I said in that press conference that what all the West is targeting is the coexistence in Syria. 
because we are very proud of the culture that we are brought up as Muslims and the Christians, as uh, Assyrians and Armenians. You know, I am a Muslim woman, but I go to churches, I go to Sidnaya, I go to Ma'lula. Um, uh, Christian people always congratulate us on our uh, 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 Eid or on our, on our uh, anniversaries or on our holy. Uh, no one in Syria ever asks anybody, what is your religion at all? This is a, an extremely socially impolite and unacceptable question. Uh, people go to uh, seek a job, to sit uh, an exam, to do whatever in any city in Syria, in any place in Syria, but nobody will ask you what is your religion because this is irrelevant. For Syrians, religion is between the person and the God. And I'll give you one final, very important example. When the terrorists win, went to the Idlib area, the Idlib area is mostly composed of Sunni Muslims, although we don't, we hate this, uh, you know, to mention that, but that's, that's the truth. Most, about 2 million people migrated from rural Aleppo and from Idlib area to Mashta al to Tartus, to Latakia, where the population is almost completely Christians and Alawite, and there was not a single incident. Quite the contrary. People started establishing factories together, working together, learning from each other, and loving being together. That now, although many rural areas in Aleppo were liberated, many of the people decided to stay where they are, in Latakia or in Tartus or in Mashta al-Hulu or whatever. In fact, this is the jewel of the lives of the Syrian people, and it is inherited one generation after another. It is our culture. It is absolutely embedded in the milk we drink from our mothers. And, and I would love that to be an example for other countries rather than to be targeted by Western imperialist countries. Well, Dr. Shaban, I think we completely share that sentiment you just expressed. And I thank you again for joining us. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you in better times, especially after we end the Caesar sanctions. Thank you. Sorry, is that a question or, or your, your statement? No, that's just a statement. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Helga, for inviting me always. And I hope, I think this is the time to make Scheller Institute a leading uh, narrative, your narrative to be a leading narrative in the world. I think most people everywhere need this and want this and are ready to join party with you and work with you for this noble cause you have been embracing for the last 50 years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us. We will do more things together. Hopefully. Thank you very much. God bless okay. you. Thank you. Take care. Now we're going to continue the discussion of the situation in Syria with the presentation from Colonel Richard Black, a former U.S. or a former state senator from Virginia, also a member of the Virginia House of Delegates but also the former head of the U.S. Army's Criminal Law Division at the Pentagon. The title of his presentation is The Immorality of Sanctions, the Case of Syria. I'm Senator Dick Black, uh, and uh, I'm, first of all, let me introduce myself. Uh, I spent 32 years in the military. Uh, I fought in Vietnam as a Marine Corps officer. Uh, I, I flew. Uh, in combat as a helicopter pilot. My plane was hit by enemy fire four times. I then fought on the ground in some of the most fierce combat of the war. Uh, I was wounded, both of my radium and were killed right beside me fighting. So I come at this as a patriotic American. I've shed a bucket of blood for this country and uh, uh, I want my country to succeed, but I also want it to be a good and decent country. Um, 
Now, let me recap for you uh, the history of the United States in the war in Syria. In 2011, that was the year that the war first began. The war has been going on for 10 years, but it started in 2011. And before it actually had developed into a full-fledged war, there were domestic protests in, in Syria. And the Central Intelligence Agency uh, sent agents from the Special Activities Center. They surreptitiously entered the sovereign territory of Syria against all international laws. And their mission was to lead Al-Qaeda-linked terrorists in overthrowing the government of, of Syria. Now, keep in mind that Al-Qaeda was the group that flew the jets into the Twin Towers and the Pentagon on 9-11, killing 3,000 Americans in the greatest terrorist attack in our history. So these were the people that the CIA was organizing and leading. They used weapons looted from the U.S. attack on Libya. Those weapons were funneled across the border into Syria, where they, in a campaign that involved mass deliberate rape of women and children, it involved beheadings, it involved crucifixions. We were literally crucifying Christians on crosses, uh, and this was being done at the instigation of the Central Intelligence Agency and with their funding and with their, with their leadership and their direction of, of Al-Qaeda. Uh, as this went on, uh, the, the Al-Qaeda terrorists actually opened slave markets in certain places and they made bond slaves of Christian and Yazidi women and children. They actually had published price lists in which the highest prices went for the smallest girls. Uh, it was the desire of these terrorists to rape little girls. And uh, unfortunately, this was happening with the, with the support, with the arms, with the organization supplied by the United States. Um, despite what we had done, uh, despite the enormous force that was rallied against Syria to overthrow it, the people of Syria rejected radical Wahhabi Islam, and they rallied around their president and around the army, and they drove the terrorists from most of Syria. Um, in 2014, there was a nationwide election conducted, uh, and President Bashar al-Assad was overwhelmingly elected in a fair and free election uh, that was involved three quarters of all the electorate of the country, and it was monitored by 30 nations. I think almost everybody agreed that yes, it was a full and fair election. So he won the election then. Um, by 2015, the war was beginning to turn badly against the terrorist. Uh, and uh, in 2016, uh, the Al-Qaeda terrorists suffered their great defeat in the industrial city of Aleppo. It was very much like the, uh, the lost battle at Stalingrad that, was, that signaled the demise of the, of the Nazi armies in the Second World War. Uh, the loss of Aleppo was a stunning and huge defeat for Al-Qaeda and for the forces of the United States that had orchestrated this movement against the people of Syria. Now, in 2015, Secretary of State John Kerry uh, announced uh, out of frustration with the failure of the terrorists to seize the country, he said, we're going to have a plan B. It, it, this was very vague what he, what he said, but, uh, but the facts, the promises of uh, Barack Obama that not one boot would set foot on the ground of, of Syria immediately the United States began pouring U.S. troops onto the ground in Syria, and we seized control of northern Syria from the Syrian government. The reason that this was especially important is that northern Syria is the breadbasket of Syria. It also supplies the oil 
natural gas for Syria. And as a consequence, the the legacy of Syria, the thing that that all Syrians relied on for their food and for their fuel was stolen from them. The United States actually uh, began, it actually authorized an American company to build a $150 million refinery and to do drilling in uh, northern Syria in order to steal their legitimately owned oil and, and natural gas. Um, the, uh, the objective of all of this was to starve to death the Syrian people and to cause them to freeze to death in the winter. Uh, the, uh, uh, we, we began then, we, we enacted what were called the Caesar sanctions. This was during the time that Secretary Mike Pompeo became the Secretary of State. And he uh, announced maximum pressure campaigns because the United States had figure out, figured out a workaround so that uh, even though international law said that it was unlawful to blockade a nation and prevent them from receiving supplies unless you were at war, we found that we could do this. Now, first of all, we just ignored the provision on blockades. We actually have a naval blockade in place. But beyond that, we had discovered that by taking control of the banking system that, uh, that facilitates transactions in Syria, we were able to effectively block them from receiving medical supplies. I know when I visited in 2016, that women were dying of breast cancer because they could not get ordinary uh, medication that saves the lives of women in this country from breast cancer. We did this deliberately to create this intense feeling of suffering and hopelessness. Today, uh, there are bread lines in Syria. Now, we have imposed, Congress passed what are called the Caesar sanctions, and using the Caesar sanctions, we have imposed these tremendously harsh sanctions on the nation, caused bread lines to form, uh, and there is, there is active starvation taking place. There's a famine in Syria on a very massive basis. People freeze during the winter. Now we're coming out of the winter, so the freezing has stopped. Those people are dead, they're gone. And now the starvation uh, takes hold. That's the primary weapon that the United States uses. Um, there was a there was an op-ed published in the Politico this this June. A fellow named Charles Lister, who advocates for the overthrow of the Syrian government, he said that uh, with the coming of the Caesar sanctions, there will be even greater levels of destitution, famine worsening criminality and predatory behavior as a result of the new sanctions. And he said cheerfully that this was an opportunity for the United States to achieve regime change in Syria. I've got to tell you that uh, I am not proud of my nation for creating bread lines, for creating starvation and famine, for causing children and elderly people to die. You know, Syria was a very moral country, a very moral, decent, uh, merciful, loving people. They're very kind people in Syria. And now we're forcing children in Syria to resort to prostitution and to, to prostitute themselves in order to get a slice of bread so that they don't starve to death and drop dead in the streets. This is not something that Americans should take pride in. This is despicable. The LA Times said that, uh, that the sanctions have been especially harsh on medical supplies, making chemotherapy drugs increasingly difficult to obtain. The Financial Times on June the 24th reported that the Caesar Act's first impact was not on regime in insiders, but on ordinary Syrian peasants who saw their, their money devalued, prices soar, 
and the bread lines form. We are causing, we are deliberately causing mass starvation, mass famine. These are things that we accused the Nazis of uh, in the Nuremberg trials at the end of the Second World War. If it's a crime for the Nazis to do these things, it is a crime for us to do it. It is loathsome, it is despicable. The idea that we have used mass rape across the country as a tool of war is just loathsome. And I would never have been a part of have taken action personally. I was declared, I, I had declared that if, if the My Lai massacre had occurred when I was there, I'd have taken my rifle and I'd have shot the, the company commander who ordered it to take place. I think what we're doing here is far worse than the My Lai massacre. It is on a massive nationwide scale. It is despicable, it is loathsome, and we need to reject it. It is time that the American people found out what is being done, found out about our close alliance with Al Qaeda and put an end to it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Colonel Black. Uh, in a moment, we're gonna be hearing from Dr. Hans Kirschler, uh, but I, I have a message of greetings first from Dr. Ivan Timofeyev, who's the Director of Programs at the Russian International Affairs Council and the head of Euro-Atlantic Security Program of the Valdai Club. Uh, he was unable to be with us today, but he said, I wish you a productive conference on these urgent topics. And he said he would be happy to join us in the future. He and his group at the Russian International Affairs Council are preparing a study on how the sanctions regimes are the sanction regime is, regime is continuing during the COVID crisis, despite pleas for humanitarian exemptions from targeted states and United Nations officials. So we look forward to hearing from him in the future. So our next speaker is Dr. Hans Kirschler, who is a university professor of philosophy uh, emeritus in Vienna. And he's also the president of the International Progress Organization. His topic is unilateral economic sanctions, immorality and arrogance of great powers. Dr. Kirschler. Mrs. Zepp-Laroche, ladies and gentlemen, Karl von Clausewitz famously said that war is a continuation of politics by other means. Looking back at the course of international affairs in the decades since the end of the Cold War, one might add in analogy, sanctions are the continuation or conduct to be precise of war by other means. The juxtaposition highlights the crucial problem of the excessive use of unilateral sanctions in today's global system. Under the influence of the United States, economic coercion appears to be a more or less unquestioned instrument in the conduct of power politics. In the absence of a global balance of power, sanctions have indeed become a tool of choice in a new version of asymmetric warfare in situations where the intervening state intends to achieve maximum results with minimum risk for itself. These, in most cases, indiscriminate, only pretendedly targeted measures are meant to complement the use of armed force preceding, accompanying, or following it with the aim to force the targeted country into submission. As such, sanctions are part of the arsenal of warfare. Under no circumstances, whether in unilateral or multilateral form, are sanctions compatible with a diplomacy or with a policy of uh, peace. They are always sensu stricto, 
a form of violence. Right upon the end of the Cold War, the most obvious example of this, uh, as one could say, weaponized foreign policy approach was the comprehensive economic sanctions regime imposed on Iraq from 1990 until 2003, up to the moment when the United States with her allies had achieved regime change by armed aggression and subsequently had occupied the country. In terms of moral philosophy, but also of legal doctrine, comprehensive as well as so-called sectoral sanctions, such as those now unilaterally enforced against Syria, are in and of themselves a form of collective punishment and thus in violation of fundamental human rights, which in our modern understanding are part of the use cogens, that means of the binding rules of general international law. Except in rare cases of self-defense, unilateral economic sanctions are always illegal. They are tantamount to an arrogation of sovereign power over other states. Only as uh, multilateral enforcement measures in the collective uh, security system of the United Nations may sanctions be legally justified, as Mrs. LaRouche has already explained. And this is only possible, this uh, justification, on condition, on condition that the measures do not violate basic rights of the population in the targeted country. In legal terms, the violation of a country's sovereignty is generally inadmissible, except if it occurs under the collective authority of the United Nations Security Council in a resolution based on Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. Such decisions can only be taken if the Council first has determined that there exists a breach of or a threat to the peace in a particular situation. The Council is not above the law in the exercise of its coercive powers. It is bound by the rules of the UN Charter and by the fundamental norms of human rights. Nonetheless, as the sanctions against Iraq have demonstrated, the supreme executive organ of the United Nations may effectively act as if it were above the law when its agenda gets hijacked by one or more powerful permanent members. The all-out sanctions against Iraq pursued until the eventual invasion of the country constituted one of the most serious international crimes in post-World War II history. The answer why this was at all possible highlights the predicament the world is faced with today when the most powerful country with increasing frequency enforces sanctions unilaterally targeting countries at its discretion according to what it declares its legitimate national interests. The multilateral Iraq sanctions were kept in place for more than a dozen years because the United States was able to keep the Security Council hostage of its Machiavellian agenda vis-a-vis -vis that country. Due to the Security Council veto, the US had the power to prevent the lifting of the sanctions until it was satisfied with the result, namely the collapse of the governmental system. This happened after up to a million of people had died due to the sanctions and the damage caused to civilian infrastructure and services. A fact that, by the way, was documented as early as 1996 in a report of the Harvard 
a study team in the United States. The historical facts dictated by the logic of power politics are plain and simple. In the unique constellation, when the bipolar power balance between the United States and the Soviet Union was about to disappear in 1990, the United States was able to get the other veto-wielding countries in the Security Council on board, so to speak. Not only did the US get the sanctions resolution adopted initially, by virtue of its veto, the US was also in a position to hold the entire council hostage of its erstwhile decision. The sobering truth of the matter is that sanctions under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter will go on indefinitely if only one permanent member objects to their suspension or lifting. Such is the reality of great power politics in the UN system, unfortunately. The predicament of power politics is even more serious and consequential in cases of unilateral sanctions. In the years following the collapse of the Eastern Bloc and the disintegration of the Soviet Union, the resulting unipolar power constellation, though temporary as we now know, this uh, unipolar constellation not only enabled the Western Bloc to get mandatory resolutions such as those on the Iraqi sanctions passed by the Security Council. Whenever endorsement of punitive measures by the Council could not be obtained, the United States with her allies felt strong enough to go it alone. This was also evident in the use of force against Yugoslavia in uh, 1999. It is no surprise that in a milieu of global anarchy, where checks and balances on the actions of a global superpower have become dysfunctional, a culture of impunity flourishes and self-righteousness takes the place of law. The so-called, uh, already mentioned here uh, in the meeting, the so-called Caesar Syria Protection Act of 2019 is a case in point, as are the sectoral sanctions against Yemen that took effect exactly on the 19th of January 2021 the day before the coming into office of the new president of the United States. These are unilateral measures imposed without even a semblance of consultation with the international community and not authorized by the United Nations. The US falsely claims to have the right to enforce these sanctions extraterritorially that means vis-a-vis -vis third parties that are not involved in the dispute between the United States and Syria or the United States and Yemen. The euphemism secondary sanctions cannot hide the fact that we are dealing here with an imperialist arrogation of uh, sovereignty in total neglect of international law. The hypocrisy and outright immorality of such a policy has by now become obvious to every fair observer. After stoking a civil war, by intervening, since 10 years now, by the way, by intervening on one side of the conflict in Syria, the United States punishes the entire population of an already profoundly destabilized and weakened state with measures that cause widespread suffering and devastation of the economy. It reveals an attitude of arrogance and self-righteousness that is typical of imperial rule. Insisting to punish the Syrian government for, uh, as the United States state, for committing atrocities and to bring about an end to human rights violations, which uh, are purported by the US, the enforcers of the sanctions 
have effectively prolonged the war and caused even greater instability in the entire region. Uh, the extraterritorial enforcement measures or the enforcement of the measures means that in the sectors covered by the so-called Caesar Act, transactions and business deals with Syria anywhere in the world are banned, even when they have no connection to the United States. Although such a practice is patently illegal, the international community is condemned to the role of a mere monitor of events. Due to the great power veto in the Security Council, the US enjoys virtual immunity in the conduct of its unilateral policies. The situation will only change if there is a shift in the global balance of power and other states eventually feel strong enough to ignore or challenge United States demands. The tragedy inflicted upon the people of Syria and more recently of Yemen is tantamount to a crime against humanity. According to the Nuremberg principles, one might say, but actually also according to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. However, neither the targeted countries nor the United States are state parties to the court. The world is faced with the scandalous situation that under the present system and mechanisms of international law, there is no legal, no effective legal remedy, whether in terms of public international law before the International Court of Justice or of international criminal law before the International Criminal Court, the ICC. The ICC might only be able to exercise jurisdiction over officials of some United States allies if it can be proven that they are or were complicit in the collective punishment of the Syrian and or the Yemeni peoples. US allies from Europe, including the United Kingdom, are state parties to the ICC, the International Criminal Court. In these cases, the prosecutor of the court would have the power to initiate an investigation. It all depends on the courage and moral integrity of the respective office holder. Last year, by the way, the prosecutor and other court officials of the ICC have come under serious pressure, including personal sanctions from the United States administration over the investigation of war crimes in Afghanistan. Even before the enactment of the Caesar sanctions by the United States, the Special Rapporteur of the UN Human Rights Council had in a 2018 report uh, come to the conclusion, though formulating it rather timidly, namely that, I quote, the accumulation of diverse and intertwined unilateral coercive measure regimes has made the human rights situation in Syria unnecessarily difficult, end of quote. It is a sad and sobering déjà vu. The suffering of the Syrian people mirrors the tragedy inflicted upon the people of Iraq almost uh, three decades ago, after a so-called New World Order was proclaimed by the then President of the United States. It is important here to note that we are not alone in this judgment, as is evident in a recent report of the foreign policy magazine in the United States. I just quote the headline of that report. It, said, it reads, Assad's Syria is starving to, starting to starve like Saddam's Iraq. How sanctions against the Syrian regime are forcing the country into famine. 
that was the title of uh, a foreign policy report, Washington DC, in December last year. It is scandalous and morally revolting that a medieval mentality and tactic of siege warfare has become part and parcel of uh, the inventory of great power politics at the beginning of the third millennium, depriving an entire population of the vital resources to force it in order to force it into submission is nothing short of an international crime. If this is allowed to stand, there will be no progress of humanity, in spite of all the humanitarian language used to justify such practices. In conclusion, in today's real politic, unilateral sanctions follow the logic of blackmail and naked power. Because according to the design of the current UN system, power ultimately, and unfortunately, I would say, trumps law. It is all the more important to raise the moral awareness of international civil society, so as to put pressure on those governments that pursue or condone a Machiavellian policy of collective punishment. I would like to stress here the special role and responsibility of religious institutions in defense of human dignity. This particularly relates to churches in those countries whose governments have made sanctions a tool of their foreign policy, to put it bluntly. We value the public call of His Eminence Cardinal Mario Zenari for the lifting of the unilateral sanctions imposed on the Syrian people. In a global meeting of Caritas Internationalis, he minced no words, equating the consequences of sanctions to those of warfare. Apart from condemning the policy of punitive sanctions in general, church leadership should also make clear vis-a-vis -vis state leaders of uh, Christian uh, denomination that those acts violate the basic tenets of the Christian faith. As to our knowledge, most of the responsible office holders in the countries that use sanctions as a tool of foreign policy, including the current, current president of the United States, a Roman Catholic, most of those leaders are members of uh, Christian communities, Christian churches. At this juncture, the first priority must be the provision of humanitarian aid as called for by Caritas and other non-governmental organizations, such as the Schiller Institute. The Committee to Save the Children of Iraq sponsored by the International Schiller Institute, launched a similar initiative after the 1991 Gulf War, which we in our organization supported at that time. Emergency aid measures should be complemented by a civil society campaign in the countries that bear primary responsibility for the continuation of the war, and in particular, the war through sanctions, as I would call it. Apart from dealing with the symptoms, it is required also to address the causes of the humanitarian catastrophe and to draw lessons for the future. And this is exactly also what this, our meeting of today is all about, I would say. The noble principles of human rights, supposedly the core of our democratic polities and the basis of international legitimacy will be utterly meaningless if we allow governments that claim to act in our name to put power above law and to continue punishing entire peoples in the name of humanity. 
This would indeed signify the moral collapse of the transatlantic world, which at this stage of global affairs, only an alert and valiant civil society can prevent through challenging its leaders in the court of public opinion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Kirschler, and uh, I hope you'll be able to stand by for questions after the other speakers. Yes, uh, we're, we're now going to move on. We, we now have a presentation from Dr. Wilfried Scheiber, a senior research fellow at the World Trends Institute for International Politics here in Potsdam, Germany. His topic is Global Governance, an answer from China and Russia. Dear Mrs. Zepler-Rouge, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for allowing me to speak to you, especially on a day like that. Today has been a special day, day for me since my childhood. For the people of Eastern Germany, DDR, the 8th of May was a national holiday for over 45 years as uh, the day of surrender and victory in the Second World War and the day of liberation from Nazi barbarism. For this, the sincere thanks of all German citizens belong to the Allied victorious powers. This was the decisive prerequisite for a new democratic be beginning in the West as well as in the East. Above all, we should not forget that it was the Soviet Union invaded by Germany which had to pay the main part of the blood toll for this victory and liberation. 20 to 25 million citizens of that country gave their lives for it, not to mention the huge devastation of their own country. In the race for the German capital and in the battle for Berlin alone, some 170,000 Soviet soldiers lost their lives in the last two weeks of the war. They played a major role in saving Germany from the first American atomic bombs, which were actually intended for Berlin and Dresden. This is the greatest cultural act we have to thank the Soviet Union for. Today, 76 years later, Russia is once again presented as the enemy to the citizens of this country. Day after day, the mass media pour buckets of hatred, malice and slander on this country and its representatives. Today, 76 years after the end of the war, we must note that the confrontation between the great powers have taken on a dimension more dangerous than that of the Cold War period, given the technological progress of the last 30 years. And gefährlicher ist als die in der Zeit des Kalten Krieges. Particular since the beginning of Joe Biden's presidency about 100 days ago, the rivalry between the United States and the European Union on the one hand and Russia and China on the other has intensified dramatically. There is no doubt that the beginning of this process started at the latest during Obama's presidency. The Russians and the Chinese are by no means entirely blameless in this either. But we should not only look paralyzed at the real contradictions in the world today, but also recognize the signs that point to possible solutions. One such example is a joint statement issued by the Russian and Chinese foreign ministers in Guiyin on March 24 this year. For the first time, China and Russia signed a joint political declaration of principles, which was addressed to the transatlantic West, but was hardly noticed by the official policy of the West. Diese Erklärung versteht sich als alternative Antwort 
This declaration sends two signals to the Western world. For China and Russia have questioned the generality of the West's political rules of the game, particularly the West's interpretation of democracy and human rights. Insbesondere die Interpretation des Westens über Demokratie und Menschenrechte. Nach diesen Spielregeln werden unter dem Schlagwort Under the slogan of the rules-based order, Western interpretive patterns for democracy and human rights are being made the benchmark for global development. This view is based on the self-image of the transatlantic West as the highest level of human, human civilization to which all other cultures, when the framework of which the nearly 200 nations of this world coexist, must subordinate themselves. Unterzuordnen haben. Man sollte sich an den US-amerikanischen Politologen One should remember the US political scientist Samuel P. Huntington, who already in the mid 90s, in his book Clash of Civilizations, called the belief in the universality of the Western world as, quote, false, immoral, and dangerous in a policy of the West that does not take different cultural values into account. Huntington recognized the root of conflicts between nations of different cultures. This is precisely what is evident in the recent wars in the Balkans, the Caucasus, in the Middle East and Near East. De facto hat die Verabsolutierung der westlichen Werteorientierung in der Außenpolitik De facto, the absolutization of Western values in foreign policy has a missionary character with a neocolonialist claim. Entspricht dem Lebensmittel this model of civilization corresponds to the life image of the white man who has consistently practiced his global claim to power since the beginning of the 16th century and has attempted to subjugate the non-European world ever since Columbus discovered America. This is ultimately structural racism. I cannot go further into that, but the G7 summit, which took place this week, exactly manifested this claim of power. With a joint declaration of their foreign ministers of March 24, 2021, China and Russia have sent a signal that the time of colonialism and neocolonialism is finally over. The claim to universality of the Western canon of values was rejected. This brings me to the second signal emanating from this declaration. The unity of the world is reflected in its diversity, and this diversity demands cooperation and dialogue across all different interests and contradictions. This is the core of the declaration, which the Western world does not want to perceive. This second signal points to the solution of the conflict and is in this respect also an offer to the West. The joint declaration calls for, quote, putting aside differences, developing mutual understanding and cooperation in the interests of common security and geopolitical stability, quote, end. In doing so, it emphasizes the common preservation of the international legal system, and in this international legal system, the United Nations is assigned the central role. The commitment to the United Nations organization is a quintessence of the Russian-Chinese position. In particular, it is a matter of strengthening the UN Charta and the principles and goals enshrined therein. What is meant here are the principles of equality and sovereignty of all peoples and states and the consideration of their national characteristics instead of the absolutation of Western values. Vorherrschaft und das Recht des Stärkeren 
not supremacy and the right of the strongest should dominate the world order, but the common responsibility of all nations in a multilateral system. The declaration therefore refers to the permanent members of the Security Council who are to, quote, take the lead in protecting international law and the world order based on it, end quote. That is why a summit of the permanent members of the UN Security Council is also proposed. Russia and China by no means emphasize the values of their cultures and nations, but merely want to vote, conduct a dialogue in these areas for the benefit of the peoples of all countries on the basis of equality and mutual respect. Quote end. At the end of the declaration, dialogue as a central instrument of international policies is again explicitly emphasized, aiming at uniting all countries of the world instead of serving confrontation. We need dialogue not in spite of confrontation, but because of it. And not the abolition of the United Nations, but its strengthening is the need of the hour. Despite all the real shortcomings of this unique institution, and the many attempts to abuse or destabilize it for hegemonic interests, the following is true. There is no alternative to this institution of the international community of nations, and this institution also has a power to live up to its responsibilities. The implementation of the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons testifies to this. The non-nuclear weapon states have prevailed. This treaty has been valid international law since January 22 of this year, legally effective, however, only for the 86 signatory states. This is a start that needs to, to be built on. Dialogue is the central instrument for reducing confrontation and building a real multipolar world. And the United Nations organization is a bridge we must build to achieve this. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Schreiber. Our, our next presentation is from the Minister Councillor Syed Mushtaba Ahmadi, who is the Deputy Chief of Mission at the Embassy of Afghanistan in Canada. His topic is a perspective for the economic development of Afghanistan in the setting of the new Silk Road. At its height, Afghanistan stood at the crossroad of the historic Silk Road, where different cultures and societies from around the world met and exchanged ideas and goods with one another. Today, Afghanistan is working hard with the countries concerned to revive the Silk and Lapis Lazuli roads, as well as to contribute to the improvement of Central Asia, South Asia, China, Turkey, Europe, the Middle East, and the rest of the world. Afghanistan's integration into the Belt and Road Initiative, including the operationalization of Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India gas pipeline and also Kosovo 1000, Central Asia and South Asia. This is a, a electricity transmission line. And the Chabahar port will help to boost uh, trade, transport, transit and cooperation among the regional and beyond. Afghanistan government's vision for expected end the state of peace talks is we are all Afghans including minorities and women enjoy their fundamental constitutional rights. Uh, currently, uh, we are focusing on preservation of the Afghanistan's achievement over the last two decades, such as the Republic and the Afghan women's and minorities' constitutional rights. 
women's rule and Afghan uh, peace process, preserving Afghanistan's two decades of development and milestones and women's rights. Afghanistan is situated at the center of the Persian Gulf, the Caspian Sea, and Central Asia, which contain the world's three largest hydrocarbon reserves. By capitalizing on its geostrategic position as well as mineral and energy wealth, Afghanistan has a great deal of potential in playing an important role in stabilizing the Middle East and the world by establishing Afghanistan as an economic bridge between South Asia, Central Asia, the Middle East, Europe, Canada, the United States, and beyond. So this is a perspective for the economic development of Afghanistan and setting off the new Silk Road. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ahmadi. I, I want to remind people after the next three presentations, we will be opening up a general question and answer session. We've gotten a number of questions so far. You can send your questions to questions at schillerinstitute.org. Now we're going to hear from Professor Eric Denesa uh, from France, who's the director of the French Center for Intelligence Research. And his topic is Reflections for a New Foreign Policy. France no longer has a foreign policy worthy of the name. Its international action seems to be guided more by the moods of its presidents than by reason, as witnessed by Nicolas Sarkozy's American Ophelia, François Hollande's Syrophobia, and Emmanuel Macron's need to lecture the world. Moreover, for the past decade, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has been under the influence of a handful of diplomats won over by American neoconservative ideals, who impose their views on all issues. It is clear that our international action today is incoherent and does not serve our national interests. This is why we believe it is useful to offer a few ideas, five principles, and a few points of application in order to contribute to the reflection on a new foreign policy so that our country regains its international credibility. Principle number one, return to a realistic appreciation of international relations. The world is not what we would like it to be, nor is it likely to become so. This is why we must look at it in a clear-eyed manner in order to promote and defend our interests and to contribute at our level level to international peace and stability. To do so, it is essential not to be blinded by ideology or by friendships that could alter our perception of events or influence our orientations. Unfortunately, our diplomacy today is characterized by this type of error, which makes it incoherent and partisan, and which has caused us to lose, in a decade, a large part of our international credibility. Second principle, reaffirm our independence in assessing situations. French foreign policy must regain its full autonomy because since the mid-2000s it has been totally aligned with that of the United States. The American vision of the world is not ours, and Washington's international policy is questionable, even dangerous, in many respects. Such autonomy cannot exist without courage and independence of judgment. This implies that we must have both an efficient foreign intelligence system and a true vision of international relations, which are currently non-existent. However, it is not just a matter of being different or original for the sake of existing, but of bringing a truly independent and thoughtful point of view to the concert of nations, because throughout the world, people are hoping for an original and free voice. Our country, with its particular vision, experience, and history, has long played this useful role in the international community. We must return to it. Without this independence of mind, we are condemned to be relegated to a second-class role in the concert of nations. And without the courage that must necessarily accompany it, we cannot be credible in order to play a mediating role in the resolution of international crises and conflicts. Above all, this could eventually lead us to lose our permanent seat at the UN. Third principle, strengthen our external military intervention capabilities. Even though all external operations should be considered with utmost restraint, the fact remains that military action capabilities, coercion or interposition, remain one of the major assets of our foreign policy and of our global consideration. Whatever the importance that the modern world places on influence capabilities, diplomats without an army are little listened to and carry little weight. 
The excessive reduction of our military tool over the last two decades directly harms our diplomatic and economic action on the international scene. It is essential that we have sufficient and independent means to act without waiting for the goodwill of some of our allies. It is not acceptable that we should have to call almost systematically on American logistical resources to conduct our interventions. Fourth principle, give our diplomacy the means necessary for its action. The Foreign Affairs Ministry, which is one of the smallest ministries in the French government, has a constrained and constantly shrinking budget, and the destitute situation in which some of our embassies find themselves does not allow them to have the means of action necessary for the challenges and our ambitions. Whether in the areas of culture, development, humanitarian action, or the French-speaking world, the resources of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs are highly insufficient and do not allow it to effectively ensure France's influence in the world. Principle 5. Strengthen our economic diplomacy. Since the end of the Cold War, the economy has once again become a central issue in international relations, and trade rivalries between developed nations have increased considerably. In a context that often involves economic warfare, it is essential that our diplomacy contribute directly to the prosperity of our country by allowing our companies to access international markets under optimal conditions and that we be able to acquire from our foreign partners the natural resources we need. We must recognize that economic affairs play as important a role today as political issues and that our export successes contribute directly to the strengthening of our diplomatic and military capabilities. After these five principles, these points of application. One, if the idea of Europe and its construction need not be questioned, the modalities of the latter must undeniably be reviewed, failing which this project could be rejected by the European peoples themselves. The current dogma and single-mindedness, as well as the excessive power of the Brussels technocracy, have shown their limits and do not meet the expectations of the nations and citizens of Europe. The new members from Central and Eastern Europe joined the Union without meeting the criteria imposed on their predecessors. These two hasty entries have had harmful effects on the common edifice, security, criminality, competition, etc., and have contributed to accentuating the pro-American and anti-Russian orientation of Europe, which could be observed during the Ukrainian crisis. The current system seems blocked and needs to be reinvented. Brexit could be an opportunity to put the process back on track, to clarify the positions and expectations of the member states, and to identify those with whom collaboration for closer integration is possible. Second point of application. Since the end of the Cold War, the United States has experienced a worrying drift towards hegemony, both economic and military. Its aggressive and irresponsible policy was demonstrated by the illegal invasion of Iraq in 2003, which permanently destabilized the Middle East without being of any use in the fight against terrorism. Their political and financial support for the Arab revolutions, 2011, contributed to sowing chaos throughout the region without in any way satisfying the democratic aspirations of the populations. On the contrary, in order to further its interests, Washington systematically helped the Muslim Brotherhood, promoters of radical Islam, to come to power. These have since been overthrown by popular reaction wherever they have come to power, Tunisia, Egypt, etc. The Americans are constantly warning about Russian rearmament. It should be remembered that the United States defense budget, nearly $600 billion, is by far the largest in the world is greater than the combined budgets of the 10 countries that follow it, with Russia, nearly $70 billion, coming in far behind China and Saudi Arabia. By aligning itself with the American policy, our country is associated with all of its mistakes. It is therefore important to return to a reasonable distance and to a rebalancing of our alliances. This is all the more important given that, economically speaking, we are subjected to what is truly an American racket. Indeed, since the end of the Cold War, Washington has developed a planetary strategy of economic domination. The United States of America abuses a whole arsenal of methods in order to continuously strengthen its hegemony on the world markets. These methods aim to weaken foreign companies, to forbid them access to certain markets in order to reserve them for American groups, or to sanction them when they have succeeded in being economically ahead of their rivals from across the Atlantic. In this arsenal, the extraterritorial application of law and sanctions is their favorite weapon, and the legal rules enacted in Washington are now imposed on the rest of the world. Thus, the fight against corruption has been hijacked and instrumentalized by the U.S. Department of Justice to extort billions of euros from French companies, Technip, BNP Paribas, Alstom, etc. We cannot accept such practices from an ally. 
Third point of application, Russia. Russia has always been and remains today a major partner for France. After a two-decade period of erasure, Russia is again becoming a significant actor in world affairs. Russia bashing, very popular among the Western media for some time and promoted by Anglo-Saxon networks, does not reflect this reality. In the case of the crises of Libya and Syria, the Russian authorities demonstrated more sense than the Western world. In Syria, Moscow contributed to stabilizing a regime, admittedly a questionable one, and in weakening Islamists who were backed by the West. In the case of Ukraine, it is appropriate to firmly recall that contrary to false notions, Russia is not the aggressor, even though it reacted by resuming control over Crimea. Admittedly, Moscow is not as perfect a democracy as we would wish, but those who criticize Vladimir Putin seem, curiously, to take no offense at our close relations with the King of Saudi Arabia, the Emir of Qatar, or certain African heads of state. If we see a renewal of Russian hostility towards the West, it must be kept in mind that this is partly due to having rejected the hand extended by Moscow over the course of the 1990s. We must therefore reconsider our position with respect to Russia. Fourth point of application, NATO. For the above reasons, it is essential that we leave the integrated command of the Atlantic Alliance and return to the pre-2008 situation. This collective organization, which in the past played its role to the full, has had no other reason to exist since the end of the Cold War than to satisfy American interests. Of course, leaving the integrated organization will not bring us anything, but remaining in it leads us to assume collective positions that are contrary to our interests. Five, Africa. We must rebuild a major expertise on this continent, which is the basis of our international role. Indeed, we have regressed considerably on this point over the last two decades because our elites are now more interested in other regions and other markets, which are undeniably more promising. However, these markets hardly serve us in terms of international influence. As a consequence of this progressive disinterest in Africa, the United States and China are tending to occupy places that were ours for a long time. We cannot lose interest in states and peoples whose destinies have long been linked to France. All the more so since Africa is the continent par excellence of the French-speaking world. Its demographic growth is a major asset in the defense and international promotion of our language. Moreover, Africa is also a market for our companies and a considerable reservoir of natural resources to the exploitation of which we can contribute while allowing local populations to benefit from them. Contributing to the development and security of Africa must once again become a French priority in order to resolve locally certain problems which, if not solved, would inevitably have consequences on our soil. Indeed, local conditions are as precarious as ever, despite the money poured in by international organizations and Western states. We cannot stand idly by in the face of such an explosive situation, which is a breeding ground for extreme ideologies, crime, and immigration. Sixth point, Middle East. Our country is now faced with the dual threat of radical and terrorist Islam, which is based in the Middle East. Since war has been declared on Al-Qaeda and ISIS, it is therefore necessary to fight against the ideologies on which these radical movements are based, Salafism, Wahhabism, Muslim Brotherhood, and the states that support them, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Turkey. The latter government has been working for a decade to re-Islamicize the country. A 180-degree turn towards these three states is necessary because they advocate a hateful ideology contrary to our values and finance terrorism and religious, religious extremism all over the world, and even in our suburbs. We must go beyond the sometimes illusory promises of huge contracts and not allow ourselves to be bought by autocratic emirs whose behavior towards their own population and towards foreigners is even further from democratic rules than those of Syria and Iran. Similarly, we must reconsider our position towards Tehran, a major player in the Middle East, and stop seeing this country only through the distorted prism of our American, Israeli, and Sunni allies. Finally, seventh and last point, China. China is certainly not a democracy, and many criticisms can be made of its policies, human rights, Tibet, maritime claims in the China Sea. But focusing only on the road ahead and not on the changes already made will not help to change some of its behaviors. While it is obviously advisable to remain vigilant with regard to its evolution, particularly military, it would be unfortunate to deprive ourselves of possible cooperation that could be beneficial to both our countries. Today, outside the Western camp, many international actors are declaring France is back. 
This statement should be understood not as the return of our country as a major player in the international game, but rather as the fact that we have fallen into line under American leadership like all the other Europeans. This does not correspond to our history, our aspirations, or our interests. It is therefore necessary to work on a complete repositioning of our foreign policy, exiting NATO, re-establishing our independence and distancing ourselves from the United States, rethinking and then relaunching the construction of Europe, reconsidering our relations with Islamic states, revitalizing our African policy, and considering new partnerships with Russia and China. These are just a few of the avenues, not all of them, that deserve to be taken into consideration in order to renew our approach to international issues and to offer the world a different face than that of a partisan French diplomacy submissive to neoconservative ideals. Thank you, Professor Denise. Uh, now we go to a participant from Japan, uh, Daisuke Kotagawa, who's spoken previously at the Schiller Institute. He's a former official of the Ministry of Finance of Japan and also served as the director for Japan at the International Monetary Fund. His topic today is the Obama sanctions sabotage Japan-Russia development. Yeah, today I'd like to talk about the problem of economic sanctions on Russia. As you know, that the Prime Minister Abe started the negotiation with President Putin in 2012, which dealt with long-standing issue of disputed islands between two countries. For the first time of these negotiations, issues involved economic cooperation between Japan and Russia was introduced. The negotiation bore fruit of identifying eight areas of cooperation as follows. Number one, growth of healthy life expectancy, that is to say intergovernmental uh, cooperation such as disease prevention, investment and technical alliance between, between Japan, Japanese and Russian companies. The second area is, create to, is to create a city that is comfortable, clean, easy to live in, and easy to operate, such as urban environment improvement in Russia and waste disposal in eastern Siberia. Third area is drastic expansion of interaction and cooperation between Japanese and Russian small and medium-sized enterprises such as support for Japanese small and medium-sized enterprises to enter Russia. area is energy, including Japan-Russia resource exploration and development off the coast of Sakhalin Island, and also um, increasing natural gas and oil production off Sakhalin coast. Fifth area is industrial diversification and productive improvement in Russia, uh, including loans to Russian companies by the Japanese banks for international cooperation, long-term investment agreements by Japanese machine tool manufacturers. Six areas is industrial promotion and export base in the Far East, including greenhouse vegetable cultivation business through japan Russia joint venture, and construction of rehabilitation hospitals. Seventh area is advanced technology cooperation, and such as support for postal system efficiency, mobile phone, and information and communication technology cooperation. The last area is a very drastic ex expansion of people-to-people -people exchange, including inter-university cooperation between Japan and Russia, relaxation of visa issues conditions by the Japanese and Russian governments. However, a stonewall blocked the implementation of, of, this, of these projects. In February 2014, a coup d'etat toppled the Ukraine government which was planned and orchestrated by the U.S. government, headed by Victoria Nuland. And in order to avoid the use of nuclear head equipped in submarines and warships in Sevastopol by residents who are mostly ex-Russian Navy soldiers, 
President Putin declared annexation of Crimea on March 2014, after the residents in Crimea voted for independence from U Ukraine and annexation with Russia. Then President Obama visited Tokyo on April 23rd through 25th, and on April 23rd, he had a dinner meeting at the most famous sushi restaurant, Jiro, in Tokyo with Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. After the dinner, Mr. Abe was asked by Japanese journalists if he enjoyed sushi. Unlike other occasions, Mr. Abe said in a very bad temper that he could not enjoy the dinner because he was completely occupied business by business talks uh, mainly with Susan Rice. What unraveled later was as follows. Number, number one, both sides were represented by three people in, in addition to President Obama and Mr. Abe. They were ambassador of each country, Caroline Kennedy for the United States and Mr. Sasai for Japan and national security advisor for the U.S. that is Susan Rice and for Japan, Mr. Yachi. Then secondly, President Obama did not eat sushi, nor speak. It was Susan Rice that kept pressuring Prime Minister Abe to introduce economic sanction on Russia, despite the fact that Japan had already contemplated its own sanction on anonymous Russian individuals and companies who seemed to have directly involved the annexation of Crimea. As a result, Japan announced an additional economic sanction on Russia, which included certain numbers of Russian financial companies. By including the sort of financial sanctions as described above, three Japanese mega banks, which have extensive operations in New York and London, in order to get involved in US dollar trading, became under huge pressure of staying very careful of any transactions which have involved Russian companies. They are afraid that U.S. authority will unilaterally condemn a specific operation related to Russia, but related to Russian companies as a violation of sanction and penalize them. Under such case, it is very difficult for them to challenge legally. So they have become very cautious in even opening up a bank account which would be used by Japanese companies in the business with Russian companies that are not related to any business in Crimea. Accordingly, regardless of many identified promising projects in eight areas, actual development of projects has been very slow. It is true that companies involved can avoid problems if they agree not to use the US dollar as a currency for settlement. However, we have not reached such stage, with companies in Japan and Russia still maintaining their preference for US dollars. How long such attitude will be sustained? That I don't know. Thank you very much. Thank you for that presentation. We now have uh, uh, Caleb Mopen, who's from the United States, who's a journalist and political analyst and the founder of the Center for Political Innovation. And his topic is sanctions against Syria, conflict with China, who benefits? Greetings, friends. I wanna thank you for the opportunity of addressing this very important web conference about the topic of Syria and the need to end the criminal sanctions imposed on the country by the United States and the need for the United States to change its policies and how it relates to countries around the world. Syria is a country that is led by the Ba'athist Arab Socialist Party. And the Ba'ath Party of Syria, its name, Ba'ath, literally means renaissance or rebirth in Arabic. And the policies of the Ba'ath Party have been dedicated to raising the population from poverty improving living standards, and restoring the very proud history of the Arab people and advancing human civilization. 
Now, if you want to look for evidence of the success of the Syrian government and its policies, uh, you can look at sources like the Avincia Journal of Medicine. The Avincia Journal of Medicine reports that from 1970 to 2009, the life expectancy in Syria increased by 17 years. During this time, the rate of infant mortality decreased from 132 deaths per 1,000 live births to only 17.9 deaths per live births. Another great source of information about the Syrian Arab Republic and what it has done to help the population is the country study published by the U.S. Library of Congress. According to the country study, in 1981, 42% of Syria's adult population was illiterate. But by 1991, the illiteracy in Syria had been wiped out. The country study published by the U.S. Library of Congress also praises the Syrian government for its efforts to build infrastructure and provide economic opportunity. The U.S. Library of Congress country study writes, massive expenditures for the development of irrigation, electricity, water, road building projects, and the expansion of health services and education to rural areas contributed to prosperity during the 1980s in Syria. Uh, it's worth noting that the Soviet Union was a significant ally of Syria during the 1980s. Over $100 million was spent on hydroelectrical power plants that were constructed in the country. Over 900 Soviet technicians went to Syria to aid in the process of electrifying the country. Huge strides have been made in Syria to create a modern country. In Syria, you have different religious groups, Sunnis, Shias, Alawites, Christians, living together in peace, united by a secular government. In Syria, you have labor unions in the factories. You have different parties represented in the government. Syria remains one of the most modern and democratic governments in the region. However, rather than befriending this government, the leaders of the United States have been determined to overthrow the Syrian government. They have aligned themselves with some of the most reactionary forces in the region, Wahhabi extremists who seek to bring back the 1400s, who seek to carry out sectarian religious warfare. The Christian community of Syria, the Alawite community of Syria, other religious minorities, as well as the overall Sunni majority in Syria have rejected these moves. But yet, the drive to remove the Syrian government, Assad must go, as was stated by the Obama administration, those sentiments seem to be very well alive in the circles of power. And now, in their continuing efforts to destabilize the country and prolong a horrendous war, uh, these criminal sanctions on Syria continue. The Biden administration is carrying them out. And it's worth noting that the result of the efforts to violently overthrow the Syrian government has not only been creating millions of refugees, but it has been making Americans less safe. ISIL, or ISIS, or Daesh, or whatever you want to refer to them as, that horrendous terrorist group is a result of U.S. efforts to overthrow the Syrian government. These groups were armed and trained, and many of the so-called moderate rebels who were supported by the U.S. government, ended up joining the ISIL terrorist campaign, arming extremists and arming religious fanatics to overthrow the Syrian government has had catastrophic results, as we've seen all across the world. Now, it's also worth noting that Syria is very close to China. And in fact, the Jamestown Foundation wrote in 2007 that hundreds of millions of dollars have been invested in Syria in order to modernize the country's aging oil and gas infrastructure. And that the policy of trying to destabilize and overthrow the Syrian government with crippling sanctions by arming extremists, it mirrors the trade war against China. China is also a country that has lifted itself up, taken control of its economy, forced the economy to serve the nation overall, and raised millions of people from poverty. In China, there have been many 
huge power plants constructed. In fact, the biggest power plant, the biggest hydroelectrical power plant, I should say, in the world is the Three Gorges Dam. And it was created by the Chinese Communist Party. 800 million people have been lifted from poverty. At this point, uh, China has the biggest telecommunications manufacturer in the world. And not too long ago, China was known as the sick man of Asia. The turning around of China from being a deeply impoverished country into being an economic superpower is one of the most beautiful stories in the 20th and 21st century. And it is deeply, deeply mistaken on the part of our leaders to set up a situation of hostility with China. Joe Biden's recent speech where he talked about the need to, quote, win against China in the 21st century made me think the 21st century is not a horse race. We need to stop viewing politics in terms of zero-sum game, in terms of, of one country can only win at the expense of another. It is certainly not in the interest of the United States, with so much mass unemployment, with so much crumbling infrastructure, to cut itself off from the massive amount of growth that China is leading. China is not only helping itself to expand, but all across the world, China is building power plants, it's building hospitals, it's building roads, it's building infrastructure. China is trading with countries throughout Asia, throughout Africa, all with the aim of raising them up out of poverty, win-win cooperation. My hope is that U.S. leaders will abandon their policy of trying to destabilize Syria and that U.S. leaders will also abandon the policy of trying to escalate tensions with China. There's only one human family. There's only one global community. And the more we are cooperating with each other around things like technological development, poverty alleviation, eliminating the scourge of drug addiction and terrorism, the better the world will be. U.S. policy towards Syria, U.S. policy toward Russia, toward Venezuela, toward, toward Iran, toward China, toward many countries is deeply problematic. The road to peace, the road to raising countries out of poverty, the road to a better world for all, the road toward eliminating terrorism and narco gangs is the road of international cooperation. So this is the message that we largely need to communicate to our friends, to our co-workers, to everyone we know. We need to explain that sanctions are economic warfare. They destroy people's lives. They prevent people from getting access to medical care. They hurt ordinary people. And the human rights rhetoric used to justify them is often laced with hypocrisy. The U.S. government claims to be a supporter of democracy but we see them aligned with the government of Colombia that is shooting people down in the streets. We see them aligned with the austerity regime of Haiti. We see them aligned with the kingdom of Saudi Arabia with its public beheadings and its autocratic monarchy. Human rights rhetoric should not be used to wage economic warfare against independent countries, no matter where they are in the world. So let's hope that our conference today can play an important role, not only in educating people, but also in perhaps changing the tone of discourse and setting the stage for a new direction in U.S. policy, where instead of tearing down countries with sanctions, we are cooperating with them to do what's necessary as we look ahead toward a brighter future. Caleb, thank you for that. Uh, we now have, we go to the question and answer session. We have a number of questions, actually a flood of questions coming in I'll try to go through them. We, we have a limited amount of time, but Dave, if you could bring up the people we still have from the panel to take the questions. Um, the first question comes from someone from France who asks uh, Helga, but others as well, why does it seem as though the West wants to destroy the world which does not agree with American ideas? Where is the concern for the human factor? So Helga, why don't we start with you and then anyone else who wants to say something about that can jump in. I would not say the West um, because, you know, if you look at the people in the United States or in Germany, France, other countries, they, they, if they would have the real choice uh, for what was discussed here, most people would say that is completely insane. We shouldn't be doing this. I think what has happened is that 
um, you know, the transatlantic elite has you know, basically become like a, you know, like a mafias, you know, basically they're greedy of money. If you look at the, the reason why I referenced the statement by Lynn from 1971, when he said, when Nixon decoupled the uh, Bretton Woods system and the ex uh, eliminated the fixed exchange rates, and he said, if you go on on that road of you know, total deregulation of the markets, of uh, monetarist values, it will lead to war, fascism, and a new depression. I mean, the problem is that the, the paradigm shift, which has taken place in the last 50 years, basically since the assassination of John F. Kennedy, was to favor the speculators. And people have become more and more fixated on money, 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 on stocks, on you know ordinary people who have no money. They go and buy two or three silly stocks, and then they think they are the big gainers of of the system. I think it has completely you know the fact that in Germany you you hear before the news program in the TV you get the report from the stock exchange. Why, why should I watch these news? You know. Uh, anyway, so I'm saying it's not the it's not the West. I think it's the oligarchical elite which pressures or prices appreciates their speculative gain higher than you know the common good, and that has become a self automatism. And that system is now collapsing, as I mentioned, with the uh, arrival of hyperinflation. But I think you know. Everything which will save the situation is we have to get enough people to become thinking people again and reject these policies. I think uh, what Professor Kirschler said, it's the court of public opinion which will, where the decision will be made because legally there is no recourse, which is a tragedy, but it's also true. So let's have this court of public opinion you know, change the course of history, which means we have to mobilize the population. And that, that's the only hope. Uh, does anyone else want to respond to that one? Okay, well, the next question I, I think is for Dr. Kirschler, but anyone else could take it up also. Uh, there have been a couple of people who wrote and asked, what avenues are there to relieve unilateral coercive sanctions? Are there any international institutions which can be moved to intervene? The problem is uh, relates uh, first of all to the statutes. As long as the statutes are as they are, not much unfortunately can be done. Just take the a charter of the United Nations Organization. The Security Council is the, uh, on paper, is uh, the most powerful authorities authority globally. The Security Council would have the authority to take coercive measures in situations where the Council declares a threat to peace and security. Unilateral sanctions in the way they have been conducted in the Middle East have been one of the major causes of destabilization of war and of suffering. So it's a, it would be a clear cut case. The council could take a coercive measures, including uh, even the use of force, but uh, it is uh, illusory if we expect anything to happen because uh, those countries, and, and first and foremost, the United States, that engage in uh, this uh, unilateral sanctions policy are uh, have the status of permanent members. That means they can uh, veto any decision. And uh, that uh, further means that the Council will, all, will forever be paralyzed on such issues. The other avenue would be that of uh, international criminal law. On paper also, that uh, looks quite uh, promising. There is such an institution called the International Criminal Court, 
However, and this uh, uh, court would have jurisdiction over war crimes, uh, crimes against humanity in particular, uh, comprehensive or also sectoral sanctions as those against uh, Syria, uh, certainly uh, give rise to questions of uh, the commission of war crimes or crimes against humanity. Again, the problem is that this is not a really international court because uh, the most powerful players, again, first and foremost, the United States of America, are not members of the court. So there is no jurisdiction. And the, the only hope that remains is twofold. One, in regard to the development of the international system in the direction of uh, a multipolar balance of power. But this, is, uh, this will take uh, some uh, considerably more time. And I think here of a situation in which the United States, as for the time being militarily at least the strongest country, would have uh, to recalculate its actions if uh, situations would arise in which the price uh, to go it alone, to, to act unilaterally, would simply be too high for the United States because there are other powerful players who might act together against the interests of the United States. In such a, bell, in such a new multipolar constellation, uh, even the United States uh, might think twice about uh, uh, going ahead with uh, um, a, a unilateral uh, sanctions policy as it did against Iraq earlier, or against Iraq, in fact, in the name of the UN, but also acting unilaterally and recently against, uh, against Syria. And the other aspect is that which uh, Mrs. LaRouche also mentioned, and uh, which I... Um, uh, uh, suggested at the end of my presentation that there will be increasing uh, pressure in, the, in international public opinion. What that means also through the so-called new social media and so on, we have seen in particular areas, especially in the United States, how strong that pressure can be. If such pressure could build up for a good cause, such as uh, the cause against um, uh, the weaponizing of uh, sanctions and against the destabilization of entire regions of the globe, uh, if uh, that potential could be mobilized for such a purpose, that may be another uh, aspect of hope. But again, this is not even medium term. Again, this will be long term. As, as somewhat of a follow-up to that, there were a couple of questions about whether or not the European Union would stick with the United States on these sanctions, especially given what we see now with the Nord Stream 2, that the United States is intervening in German economic policy. So uh, uh, Helga, uh, Professor uh, Schreiber, uh, Professor Kirschler, any thoughts on what could happen if the, is it possible that the EU would be moving away from these unilateral sanctions from the United States in response to the attempt to sanction Germany and European countries over Nord Stream 2? Uh, Professor, Professor Schreiber, if you, yeah, why don't you answer, but make sure you pause so we can do the translation as you answer. Okay. Ja, es ist schwierig, exakte Voraussagen zu machen, weil es viele Unwägbarkeiten gibt. Aber ich möchte mit einem Zitat von Clinton zunächst beginnen. Der sagte, it's the economy, stupid. Das Entscheidende ist, wie sich die Wirtschaft in China entwickeln wird. Ja. Yeah. Translation. Dave, do we have the translation set up for that? Uh, 
die I can jump in if you want. Ja, ich höre ja. nämlich nichts. Ja, Sie höre so ich, aber... Ja, yeah, what Professor Schreiber yeah, said yeah. is um, that the answer is very difficult because there are many imponderabilities um, that he wants to start with a quote from the Clinton administration. Um, it's the economy, stupid. So a lot will depend how the economy in China is going to, deve uh, to develop. Ich wollte darauf verweisen, dass viel davon abhängt, inwieweit China seine Wirtschaft störungsfrei organisieren kann, unabhängig von den Vereinigten Staaten. Sie haben wichtige, China hat gegenwärtig wichtige quantitative Faktoren erreicht. China ist etwa im kaufkraftbereinigten Bruttoinlandsprodukt, hat die USA überfliegelt, aber ist natürlich in wichtigen Bereichen noch äh, rückständig oder hinter den USA. Und genau das ist das Ziel, was die Vereinigten Staaten haben. Sie wollen nicht, dass China und Russland natürlich auch diese ökonomische Leistungsfähigkeit erreicht. Und deshalb tun sie alles, ihnen Weg, Steine in den Weg zu rollen. Bei China ist das wohl schwer möglich, erfolgreich zu sein. China hat einen zu großen Binnenmarkt, kann sich letztlich allein behelfen. Russland ist etwas schwieriger dran. Russland hat, okay. ich würde sagen, ja, ja. Okay. Um, um. A lot will depend if China is able to develop without uh, <coughs> hindrance and <coughs> China already has, without hindrance from the US, China already has made quantitative <coughs> steps by bypassing the United States in terms of buying power and the BIP, but in very important areas, it's still behind the United States. That is why <coughs> The United States is trying to contain mainly China and also Russia uh, and put stones in the, in the way of progress. Uh, but this is very difficult in respect to China because China has a very large domestic market. Okay, ich möchte dann nur damit abschließen und sagen, dieser Kampf wird in der Sphäre der Ökonomie entschieden, in erster Linie in der, in der Sphäre der Ökonomie. Darauf, darauf bezieht sich der Bewerb und äh, ich bin guter Hoffnung, muss ich sagen, dass es China in Zukunft auch in einem engeren Verbund mit Russland gelingen wird, aus der gegenwärtigen Unterlegenheit herauszukommen und diesen, äh, äh, diese neue Qualität tatsächlich zu erreichen und sich von diesen Sanktionen zu befreien. Äh, nicht von den Sanktionen, sondern von den Wirkungen dieser Sanktionen. Und damit möchte ich das jetzt erstmal beenden. Um, he, he is saying that the fight will be decided in the spheres of economics, but he has good hope that China in the future, also in the alliance with Russia, Uh, will be able to free itself from the present still dependency and reach a new quality uh, and to get rid of the effects of the sanctions uh, on its own economy. <clears throat> well, there's a, a follow-up question to that, which is, given the attacks coming from the West, trying to break Russia from China, Is there any way that can succeed? Is the rapprochement between Russia and China strong enough to survive the attacks coming from uh, the United States? Professor well, Schreiber? Or, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, gern. Uh, ich uh, sehe das so. Uh, die westliche Sanktionspolitik treibt Russland geradezu in die Arme von China. 
und äh, äh, Russland, äh, der transatlantische Westen will auf jeden Fall verhindern, dass sich ein eurasischer Block formiert. Und zwar, er will, die USA wollen vor allen Dingen verhindern, dass zwischen Russland und Deutschland und der Europäischen Union enge, vertrauensvolle Beziehungen entwickeln, denn das wäre dann ein großer Ko Konkurrent. Okay. Uh, the aim of the Western sanction policy is driving Russia all the more into the arms of China. The transatlantic West wants to prevent that a Eurasian bloc is building itself and that especially a close relation develops between Russia and Germany and Russia and the EU. Um, <clears throat> so th th that is their aim. And Helga, you wanted to uh, say something on that. Yeah, I just, I just personally think having watched the rapprochement between Russia and China, I mean, they, they know that the whole game is, you know, to either work with Russia to get rid of China or vice versa, depending which faction there is. But I don't think that the chances to, to uh, sabotage the present very close collaboration is there because both of them are very much aware that together there is a chance to define a completely new set of international relations, which in the best case includes the United States, and that if they are divided, then all of them are looking, and the whole world looks much worse. So I'm confident that this alliance will not be able to sabotage. And Caleb, you wanted to say something on that? Well, it's interesting because in one of the first interviews that Donald Trump gave uh, during his uh, presidential campaign when he was running uh, with Bill O'Reilly, uh, he said that uh, you can't have Russia and China together and Barack Obama has done that. And he criticized the Obama administration for driving Russia and China closer together. But at this point, I think the reason that it's going to be impossible to divide Russia and China against each other is because they're really an economic match made. Uh, you know, the way Putin rescued the economy of Russia from the disaster following the fall of the Soviet Union was by recentering the economy around Gazprom and Rosneft, two state controlled uh, energy companies, a natural gas company and an oil company. And China has become a booming center of industry. The world's top producer of steel, half the steel in the world is made in China, the world's top producer of copper, etc. China needs lots of natural gas uh, and lots of oil to run its economy. Uh, meanwhile, Russia needs to sell uh, lots of oil and lots of natural gas. So pulling the two countries apart would be very difficult. During the Cold War, uh, the United States very much was able to manipulate the differences between the Soviet Union and China. And it was largely, you know, there were political, ideological differences, etc. But this is not the Cold War. This isn't uh, an ideological fight between uh, between capitalism and communism. Uh, this is rather this is rather about economics. And Russia and China are closely tied together economically. And the more sanctions and the more hostility that the United States pours onto both countries, the more that they are going to be tied together economically. And you can say the same for Iran. Uh, you can say the same for Venezuela. The more sanctions that are imposed on these countries, uh, the more close knit they become with each other. Um, and so you have to ask the question, are these sanctions really benefiting the long-term policy of the United States? Um, because at the end of the day, it's driving the countries that are targeted closer together. Um, it's building more and more of an alternative on the global international economy. Um, and it's simply leading to the United States being locked out a lot of, of a lot of the growth and development that's happening in the world. Yeah, I have a question again for Professor Kirschler. Uh, if you... Let me ask the question and then you can say if you want to comment on this previous question. Uh, someone asks, please explain the history of the rules-based order, which the governing figures of the UK, US, and other powers insist hold sway over sovereign nations, as well as over the UN and international bodies. Yeah, that is uh, a long and complicated story. So to make it as short as possible, the origin of uh, 
this rule-based order, according to how it is being discussed now in a kind of uh, polemical sense almost, is uh, the foundation of the United Nations organization after the Second World War. And the core of that uh, rule-based order would be a joint uh, authority at the global level to enforce the basic rule of the non-use of force. And the, uh, this uh, principle, namely the ban on the use of force, was uh, already agreed upon in the so-called Brion kellogg Pact uh, during the 1920s. And the United Nations Charter has um, been, um, uh, in the United Nations Charter, it is uh, definitively formulated. But the big problem of such a rule-based order, which now the US and her allies uh, propagate, is uh, that uh, the US her itself, together with other founders of the United Nations Organization, has effectively undermined any chances of creating a rule-based order for the simple reason. The, uh, an act of aggression by a member state of the United Nations is a violation of international law. The Security Council has the authority to take action against this um, act of aggression through uh, coercive means, including the use of force. There is even a military staff committee within the framework of the United Nations Security Council. But the big problem is that uh, the United States, as a permanent member of the Security Council, has the right, in case it commits an aggression, to uh, veto that resolution because it is written into the Charter that the obligation to abstain from voting for parties to a dispute does not apply to decisions on peace and security. I mean, the basic, one of the basic principles of law that a party to a dispute cannot decide about that dispute I means that I cannot uh, be the judge in my own cause, so to speak. That basic principle is being negated in through the rules of the United Nations Charter. So there is no rule, no obligation to abstain from voting if a country is the aggressor itself. And if such a country is a permanent member state of the United Nations, that means it can block uh, any act of aggression which itself which is committed by itself and that further means there is lawlessness there is impunity in terms of uh, international law and that also means by according to the principles which are in place now there can be no international rule of law within the in the present system of the United Nations. And so the entire plaidoyer for, for a rule-based order is totally dishonest. And for me, it's really uh, always uh, quite, I feel quite strange that uh, in the Western world, those colleagues in the departments of international law or in the legal departments of the um, uh, foreign affairs ministries did never raise that issue. It is, one just has to read the fine print of the United Nations Charter. And it, uh, it might be of interest also just to recall what one of the secretaries of state of the US uh, said shortly after the foundation of the United Nations, that the US would never have considered to join that organization if it would not have been granted that particular privilege, which I just mentioned. I'll, I'll just add on that. You have to look at the period from 1999 to 2004, when Tony Blair asserted the end of the uh, Westphalian system to be replaced by the idea of the so-called responsibility to protect, which was, I think, the modern impetus for the whole idea of a rules-based order. Let, let's move on to another question to come back to the, the specifics on the 
how to overcome these policies, the sanctions. And I'd like to hear from Councillor Ahmadi on this, but also Helga, I think this one is for you in particular. What can be done right now for the Middle East, Southwest Asia, as part of your worldwide health infrastructure proposal? <clears throat> well, I think that, um, you know, hopefully, I mean, I would have hoped that the recognition that a pandemic, you know, is a worldwide phenomena and that therefore any idea that you make a limes around the United States or around Europe uh, and, and completely ignore what happens in Africa, Asia, Latin America, that should have been obvious from the very beginning. And I had hoped that that recognition would have caused people to become reasonable much earlier. It did not take place for, I mean, that's a whole long story why, <clears throat> you know, America first, uh, the idea that, you know, Europe uh, somehow is uh, of, I, I don't even want to go into all the reasons for it. But now I think it is clear, you have these strains, you have the uh, mutants, uh, mutations, and I can only hope that that shock that, you know, we are in a race against time, that if we don't do that for every country in the world, even the vaccinations which we have now may not be sufficient for future variants, <clears throat> that that may change the attitude. A first tiny step in this direction is that the United States now agreed to lift the patents for the time of the pandemic for the vaccines. This has been opposed immediately by the EU, but that is not something which cannot be remedied because you could, the governments could pay the pharmaceutical firms which have developed uh, those vac vac vaccines um, and that way the encouragement to go for new research would not be dampened. So that's a phony argument. But I think, you know, I think if there is a public outcry to say that every single country on this planet needs that kind of a, a modern health system, well, then, you know, why not start in the in Southwest Asia, you know, with Syria, with Yemen, with Iraq, uh, with Afghanistan. Uh, and, you know, let's take the fact that every country needs that urgently. And, you know, I, the reason why we wanted to feature so much Syria and, and, and Yemen uh, in this conference is we want to create a public moral outcry. I mean, I think the the problem is that, you know, and that's the title of this whole conference, that the West finds itself in such a moral collapse that most people are so indifferent. You know, I told a couple of days ago somebody about the situation in India, which is horrendous. And this person said, oh, yeah, this is really terrible, and then turned and, and changed the subject. And I think that that is really what we have to cut through. Also on the question of nuclear war, by the way, which I, I would have liked that some people raise that because that's part of the problem. We are sleepwalking into a situation, you know, if the strategic command of the United States, the commander says nuclear war is now in the category of very likely, there should be a public outcry. And that's it, that in a certain sense, we, we must force this public uh, debate or else, you know, it may be very soon too late. So I would urge all of you to help to, you know, distribute the program of this conference as widely as possible. And since this will not be the last conference, but, you know, we, we see these conferences as a continuous sort of dialogue, a platform where these issues can be raised. But it is very urgent that we broaden the outreach, that we get millions and millions of people who get morally completely outraged about what was discussed at this conference. And then we have a, a leverage. So that is my hope that we can accomplish that in the short term. I have to say, Helga, you're absolutely right about the questions coming in. There's not a single one about this question of the nuclear war danger. And I think that's indicative of the unwillingness of people to confront this as a serious uh, problem. I, I want to give Councillor Ahmadi a chance if you want to say something about the 
uh, health situation in Afghanistan and also the potential importance of the Afghanistan's relationship to this Belt and Road process in terms of improving your economic situation. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. It's my pleasure uh, to be here uh, and uh, uh, I present uh, my uh, respect uh, to all of you, uh, uh, to Ms. LaRouche uh, for inviting me to this uh, important uh, conference. Uh, I believe uh, 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 South Asia or Asia uh, offers so much uh, economic uh, opportunities uh, in the region and also beyond. For example, if we work on the uh, Silk Road or uh, we could work with the regional countries to revive uh, the Silk Road that, uh, and also the Lapis Lazuli, Lapis Lazuli routes will contribute uh, to improvement of uh, the Central Asia, South Asia, China, Turkey, Europe, uh, the Middle East, and the rest of uh, the world. Uh, also, if we work on uh, like TAPI, it's called Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India gas pipeline. It's a billion, uh, it means worth it uh, projects. It uh, creates a lot of job, a lot of opportunities for the people in the region and uh, beyond. Uh, in Casa 1000, it's uh, another big project. It's uh, transmission electricity that could transfer electricity from uh, Tajikistan to uh, Pakistan uh, and also the Chabahar port. Uh, we could uh, do a business uh, via this port uh, from uh, Central Asia to South Asia and also to the East and to the West Asia. That op uh, this open up uh, trade, transport, transit, uh, cooperation among the regional countries. I also believe uh, we should open up the region for trade, business, culture, people-to-people, -people relation, and a state we sanctioned. We should work uh, with uh, the, the regional countries, with the uh, international uh, allies, to, to bring uh, a situation of economic interdependency in the region. Afghanistan could act uh, as a bridge between the South Asia and Central Asia. We offer so much uh, in terms of uh, minerals, resources, energy, and also we could act as a transit uh, hub. And uh, the health uh, situation uh, currently, uh, of course, uh, the pandemic uh, affect uh, uh, badly uh, Afghanistan as well as it's affect uh, the rest of the world. And uh, uh, our government is working uh, to tackle on that. Uh, and also, we we need really we need a peace in the region. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, these all big uh, projects and these all opportunities, we need a peace in the region. We should uh, leave uh, aside the political differences. We should focus on economic uh, opportunity. That will uh, benefit all of us and uh, finally we will have a, a peaceful uh, world. Uh, thank you. That's my comments. Uh, I hope it's uh, answered. Helga, there's a question that came in that I think is a, an interesting one to ponder, given the blocking going on in the U.S. Congress, the, the support from both parties for the war party, the, the, the war hawks. But the question is, is there any way to get Cardinal Zanari in front of the U.S. Congress to raise this question of sanctions now that it's been decided to extend the sanctions against Syria for another year? I think that's an excellent idea uh, because, um, you know, I think, uh, I don't know who said this, it may have been 
Professor Köschler, I think, yeah, that the churches have a very important role in, you know, fighting against uh, the sanctions, especially when the governments of their own country is in favor of it. And, you know, I mean, after all, the Catholic Church, I think they have one billion members. They are not insignificant in the United States. Uh, when Cardinal Senari uh, issued this call, I naturally immediately checked if there was a big publication of his call in Germany, for example. And I found that there was only a tiny grouping in, in, in Bavaria somewhere, uh, some papers had it, but not from the General Catholic Church. And uh, uh, one of the bishops, I think former head of the bishops' conference, even had endorsed the sanctions a couple of years earlier. But I think, you know, that is something everybody can do. You know, everybody is you know, either a member of a church or has some friends who are members. You know, I think we have to make a mobilization. And later in the second panel, we will fortunately have a, a representative of a, of a major church. But I think this is exactly what we should be doing. The Catholic Church should reach out. You know, we should reach out to the Catholic Church. They should reach out to all the other uh, confessions. And then they should demand that the Congress invites Cardinal Senari and that this issue is being brought in front of the U.S. Congress and other parliaments. I think this is an excellent idea and we should absolutely follow up on it. I'm absolutely supporting it. All right, we have a, a question for anyone on the panel from someone who is living in Taiwan. Who, so actually someone is addressing the war question a little bit. It raises the, the issue of uh, wouldn't it be better for Taiwan's long-term security to be less confrontational in its approach to China? And is there any reason why Taiwan has any internal reason for uh, challenging the relationship with China? It's, it's being challenged, of course, in the United States with the sending of officials over there breaking the, the one China policy. Uh, but does anyone have any thoughts on this question of, of Taiwan? Just raise your hand if you'd like to say something on it. Helga? Well, I think that, um, you know, the foreign influence in Taiwan should not be underestimated. I mean, historically, you know, Japan was uh, one of the occupiers at, at a certain point. And, you know, I think it would be absolutely in the interest of, of uh, <clears throat> Taiwan to, to, to be within the one China policy, be, have relative autonomy, um, because if not, you know, if, if the present course is forces, uh, for, uh, present course is followed, the more likelihood is, for good or for bad, the military unification, um, you know, which will be with definite losses for, for many people. So I think that the best course for, of action would be to, you know, I mean, there were, there were people in Taiwan, also exiled Chinese, who want to have the peaceful reunification. They conducted conferences in the United States. My husband used to address all of them. And th I think the mainland has nothing against such negotiations, but you know, it, it, should, it should really be all cooked down because this present situation you know, is, is extremely uh, dangerous. And I think if the population of Taiwan uh, would really think about the consequences, uh, I think they would probably not support the independence of, of Taiwan, which, you know, can only lead to a disaster. Anyone else with some thoughts on that? Well, okay, let's, oh, yeah, Caleb. Sure, well, um, it appears to me that it may be part of the strategy of the anti-China faction in the United States to try and provoke uh, a military confrontation. 
Um, the strategy may be to provoke a situation where China feels that it has to militarily retake Taiwan. So then China can be castigated as the aggressor. Um, and that this is, you know, this is something that Zbigniew Brzezinski and other foreign policy strategists in the United States have long tried to figure up out is how can we create a situation uh, where we accuse uh, the country we're going after and we can we can frame them as the aggressor. Um, you know, this is very similar to what was done with with the situation with Ukraine and Crimea. They, they staged events in a way to make Russia look as if they were the aggressor in Crimea. And I think that that is the aim. I know it's The Economist magazine. Uh, they had a you know, the cover had Taiwan and it said the most dangerous place in the world. Um, they're already playing up this notion that aggressive, expansive China is ready to retake Taiwan. Um, and and this is this is part of the strategy: make China look like the aggressor, so they can then escalate the sanctions and economic warfare. And I have a question now for Professor Kirschler again on the question of sovereignty of nations. Uh, the the undermining of sovereignty by supranational institutions. Uh, how do you see this? Uh, this much, in, much has been done in international law. There is a contrary effect to sovereignty. Could you just comment on that? There is an inbuilt uh, contradiction in the system of international law as uh, we have it today. There are two basic principles which uh, cannot so easily be reconciled. One is that of national sovereignty, which relates to the or the concept of sovereignty, let's say like this, which relates to the state. And on the basis of uh, this principle, any state has the right to decide itself without any interference from outside, from any other state or from any other actors internationally to decide on it, on the conduct of its own affairs, to conduct, to decide on the system, uh, on the political system, and also to decide on the, on whether the state wants to continue it in the, continue in the present form or to join another state or to cede certain territory or whatsoever. Uh, the other principle is that of uh, self-determination. And uh, the question is, uh, how is it interpreted? Many uh, interpret it as uh, being related to peoples, to communities, and, uh, or to uh, communities of citizens who then might be in conflict with the state uh, to which they belong. And so far, there is no uh, method to reconcile these two principles, sovereignty on the one hand related to state and uh, self-determination uh, related to peoples. But uh, as far as the relations between states are concerned, the big issue, uh, the big question, as far as I can see, is that of the emergence of uh, new forms of international organization. Traditionally, international organization meant a framework for intergovernmental cooperation. That means for the uh, cooperation among states as sovereign entities on the basis of equality. And uh, that is also or originally that would have been or that was the idea of the the League of Nations, and that was the idea of the uh, United Nations Organization. In uh, the years uh, since the foundation of the UN, however, there was uh, another development uh, in the direction of uh, uh, going beyond uh, mere intergovernmental cooperation on the basis of equality among all sovereign states namely in the direction of some supranational structure which would be placed above the state and uh, which, would, which would be a kind of new uh, legal entity. And that is, uh, by the way, the big issue we now have also in the European Union, where many 
uh, people in EU member states feel that uh, one has already gone uh, too far in that regard and that, for instance, now the legislative uh, authority in member states is effectively subordinated in many respects to decisions that have been previously taken at the EU level in Brussels, so that the national partners, so that what remains of, to the national legislatures or parliaments is just to uh, confirm the decision which has already been taken elsewhere by a body that is not uh, really democratically um, legitimized. And uh, that is the um, big problem now. And in my understanding, the situation in the United uh, Nations for the, ta for the time being, in terms of international rule of law and peaceful coexistence, can only be uh, attainable, so to speak, if one keeps the idea of the state as a sovereign actor on the basis of equality and if one does not put some other institution above uh, uh, the uh, state. If, I mean, that means one uh, should not go in the direction of a world state or a world government which would uh, more or less absorb the sovereign status of all the existing uh, entities. So let me remind all our viewers that we will have a second panel coming up uh, a little bit later after we complete this panel. And we'll be taking up the question much more. A number of people are asking questions about the green policy and, and the world modern health system that Helga has been discussing. So that will be addressed primarily in the second panel. Uh, we're running a little short on time, so I have a question here that maybe everyone would like to comment on. Uh, it's Some of you have mentioned the importance of bringing the public into the discussion over the war danger. Uh, there are, are a few people who are raising it, as we mentioned at the beginning, Helga, in your presentation, but how do we create a broad public debate on the danger of war? If you remember in the 1980s, you had the debate going on in Europe over the uh, SS-20 missiles, the, the U.S. Uh, weapons in Germany. Uh, and then we had around the Strategic Defense Initiative, Lyndon LaRouche's proposal, quite a debate going on in the United States. But today it's mostly silent. How can we bring more people into this and give them an, a, an understanding uh, or create an understanding for the elected officials that the population must be considered when you take up these questions of war and peace. So uh, I'd like each of you to say something on that, starting with uh, Caleb, you want to say something? Sure. Um, the most disturbing thing about Joe Biden's joint address to the Congress uh, was the fact that he framed his calls for infrastructure and his calls for a jobs guarantee and his repudiation of trickle down economics. He lined it up with uh, U.S. foreign policy being aggressive. He said we need to win against China in the 21st century. And somehow uh, the way uh, politics is being shifted, there's this whole rise of you know left wing folks on the Internet and young people getting interested in left wing ideas. But it's being framed up that to be a good little leftist, uh, to be a good little socialist in the United States, uh, you need to be very, very hostile to China. You need to be very, very hostile to Russia. You need to be repeating the uh, the U.S. foreign policy talking points about whatever country we're supposed to be demonizing. And that is very disturbing. You know, it used to be that leftists were known as the anti-war people, and it was the right uh, that were considered to be the war hawks. But now things have gotten very confusing. And in Joe Biden's speech, he actually went as far as trying to link uh, the events of January 6th uh, with countries around the world the U.S. is hostile to. He used the term autocracy and insurrection 
trying to link in people's minds the events of January 6th with governments around the world. And that if you are going to be supportive of Joe Biden's economic agenda uh, of, of, you know, of supposedly building infrastructure, I mean, let's wait to see what he actually does, uh, that in order to be a good supporter of it, you should be a, a vicious uh, war hawk and want to escalate tension with countries around the world. And that's very, very disturbing. And I think that that needs to be challenged. I think there are many people uh, that maybe voted for Biden or maybe have a left wing persuasion uh, that don't buy into that logic. And, and that argument that somehow wanting economic progressive policies at home lines up with wanting war abroad, that needs to be broadly challenged. Uh, Professor Schreiber, in Germany, it seems as though virtually every party at this point is challenging an alliance with Russia, is hostile to Russia. Uh, can you say something on that in terms of the situation there? Professor Schreiber, falls Sie keine Übersetzung haben. Ja, äh, es stimmt schon. Die Linke ist verwirrt. Hören Sie mich? Ja. Um, uh, okay. Uh, the, the left is confused. Can the translation be heard? Yes, okay. Okay. Uh, und uh, uh, die uh, die Politik der Medien ist bewusst auf Verwirrung ausgerichtet. Es ist eine sehr, sehr schwierige Situation. Das kann man of the media is directed to confuse people. It's a very difficult situation. Aber bezogen, ich kann das natürlich nur für Deutschland einigermaßen beurteilen. Es ist schon eine antimilitaristische Grundstimmung vorhanden. Das zeugen alle Befragungen, zeigen, wie zum Beispiel gegenwärtig. Ich kann nur talk about Germany. Uh, uh, there is a groundswell that is against war. And all the polls taken show that. Genau. Und uh, uh, Befragung hat ergeben, dass äh, die Politik Chinas und Russlands in der Bevölkerung Deutschlands als vertrauenswürdiger angesehen wird als die Politik der USA. And the polls show that the people think that the policies of Russia and China is more trustworthy uh, than the policies of the United States. Ja, und äh, äh, an dieser Grundstimmung antimilitaristischen, antikriegsgrundstimmung äh, muss man und kann man festhalten. And we can uh, uh, take up that anti-militarist and anti-war sentiment. And ich bin der Meinung, man muss sich immer wieder aufs Neue widersetzen an der Formierung von Feindbildern an der Dämonisierung Russlands und Chinas. And uh, I think that we have to uh, really resist the creation of enemy in images in the case of Russia and China. Okay, uh, ich denke, man muss auch Geduld haben. Im Prinzip uh, die Friedensbewegung existiert, sie ist verwirrt, sie ist in sich widersprüchlich, aber äh, die, äh, es gibt eine doch sehr deutliche Haltung gegen Atomkrieg und gegen äh, Einsatz, äh, Militäreinsätze der Bundeswehr. Ich, ich denke, das soll man nicht unterschätzen. And I think we have to be patient. There is a peace movement, there is a general uh, 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 rejection of, of uh, a, a war policy. People don't support nuclear war. And uh, the, the peace movement is confused, but I think we have to, to uh, work on that. Okay, so right. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. Well, Helga, I'm going to give you the last word on this. We do have a question about a video that's being shown on Italian television 
of U.S. troops landing in Estonia with parachutes, apparently as part of the Europe Defender 21. And the question is, does this, these kinds of maneuvers and exercises bring us closer to war? Is this another red line that's being crossed? Well, I think that every military person, and I don't want to speak now above the head of Professor Schreiber, is concerned that once you have a military maneuver, uh, the uh, transition to an actual uh, military action is is very smooth. It's almost you no, know, it's almost ac uh, incremental. Uh, so obviously, you know, with the tension uh, going on around, you know, what's going on in Ukraine in particular, I think I think these things should be of concern because there was all this talk about uh, <clears throat> Russians, you know, at the Ukrainian border. Um, there was no no discussion about Europe Defender 21. But, you know, as uh, Mrs. Sarkarova, the foreign uh, ministry spokeswoman, correctly noted, she said, these Russian troops were on Russian territory, but these NATO troops from 30-plus countries they were at the Russian border. So I think these things are highly dangerous. And, you know, I think, you know, the war by accident, you know, you, you don't, I mean, there are some people who say you can win a regional limited nuclear war. That does exist. But there's also the danger of an accidental war because you had in the last half year many incidents where uh, U.S. and Russian fighter jets you know, came extremely close, you know, in, in pursuit, in, in part in uh, espionage operations, where I said, you know, if world peace depends on the ability of a pilot to avoid an accident in air, then we are not in very good shape. So I think the danger of an accidental development or somebody losing their nerves or, you know, a situation where, you know, somebody just mis misjudges the situation is really too big. I think we have to really understand, we have to go back to a, a spirit of cooperation and stop this, this idea of you know, driving the other country to the edge of permanent tension by, you know, what I, read, what I said earlier about the policy of the rent corporation to overextend Russia by just driving them to the edge all the time. This is dangerous. So I, I can only say, you know, I would really urge people, if they don't believe what I said in the beginning, please investigate some time and get on top of it yourself, because it's really, it's really big and it's very serious. Well, I want to remind people again, the next panel will begin at 1 p.m. Eastern, which is in about 30, 30 minutes. I'd like to thank all the panelists who participated. And let me just wrap it up by saying that this discussion should be causing people to think, rethink what they actually believe and what they think about the situation in the world today. It is dangerous, as we started at the beginning, identifying it. We're on the edge on any number of crises, but as the Schiller Institute approach has always been, you address the problems from the higher standpoint. The, the way we're divided is to break things down into the smallest possible uh, divisions, to, to turn people against each other, to keep people from looking at the big picture and recognizing that we do have common interests and common goals, that there is such a thing as the human race. So one of the ways you can participate in this is join the Schiller Institute and help us take this message out beyond these conferences to help us build for the next conference as well. So Helga, thank you. And to all the panelists, thank you for joining us. And we'll be back in a half hour.